Hello. Hello, my name is uh, Konstantin Filinem, and I'm a CTO of the App Builder. I'm going to talk about the Apps Builder and uh, walk you through a demonstration as a way to introduction uh, to the Apps Builder. And um, we are starting. So here you can see um, a screen of uh, the Apps Builder. And uh, after this conference, you'll get, uh, you'll get distributed um, these presentations. And this is a video of um, the demo. The video is narrated. It has a sound. But right now, sound is muted. And I'm going to narrate you through this video to explain what the Apps Builder is about. On this screen, uh, I'm uh, just saying, OK, you go to theappsbuilder.com. And eventually, you click on there is this button called uh, Create Ethereum App. And uh, that will get you to the Apps Builder. OK, so we're clicking on this button. Ta -da. All right. So this is a screen where you get in to the Apps Builder. You can sign up. You can sign in. Uh, we are signing in here. So my mouse is on sign in. And um, we have uh, two ways to sign in. We still uh, support the legacy way of signing in to the Apps Builder using username as email address and a password. But most recently, for the most uh, recent account, we support uh, Google of 2 to sign in with Google. Why we do it? Because Google provides uh, much better identity, much stronger identity. And of course, we prefer new users to use um, stronger identity, multiple factor authentication, because, hey, we are dealing with cryptocurrencies, and identity is very important in cryptocurrencies. So here, I'm going to click on sign in with Google button and end up in, in the Apps Builder. Uh, let this happen in the video. All right, all right, okay. Okay, so I signed into the Apps Builder using um, Google Authentication. I had my multiple factor authentication at my Google account. So what we hear, what you see, what we see on the screen. On the screen, you end up in uh, our menu where you can create several smart contracts, and uh, this is a templated way to create smart contracts without needing uh, to learn Selenium, uh, Selenium, and uh, other technologies. We, right now, today, we offer three types, three different types of smart contracts. You can see it on the screen. It is voting, escrow contract, and um, multi-signature wallets. Different types of contracts require you to enter different uh, inputs uh, for, to create the contract initially. Like, for example, here I'm creating a multi-signature wallet, and uh, I need to specify who are going to be the owners of this wallet. If I need to add another owner, then I'm going to do it now. You see it on the screen, and uh, I'm going to click on add an owner. So there is going to be another person who can potentially sign off a transaction on a multi-signature wallet. And uh, similar is going to be Similar configuration screens are going to be in escrow. There you go. Uh, here, uh, what, what is escrow about? Let's say I am selling a fridge, and I would like um, to ship you a fridge. You are supposed to ship me money, and I'm going to have some agent to release the money, your money to me once I have shipped the fridge to you. So here you can specify my address of, um, as a seller of the fridge, buyer address, who is getting uh, the fridge, and um, whoever is going to arbitrate the dispute or release the money once uh, the dispute is shipped to you. This is basic configuration screen. Uh, you, figure, you, you configure those settings here. This is my Ethereum address. And same thing goes for the voting contract. Again, you list uh, the way how voting works. You list several candidates. You le let people vote for the candidates. And this all gets recorded in um, the screen. So, But uh, we are not going to create a contract here right now because I already had several contracts created. And like you see, there are a couple of um, those contracts of escrow type. So it's called, they're called selling a fridge and uh, another selling a fridge again. And uh, the last contract that we see here is a um, uh, multi-signature contract multi-signature wallet about paying 10 Ethereum efforts. So it, there are owners of this contract. You can see this is just to demonstrate 
what's going on here. One important point, um, it's necessary to make sure that you have installed um, MetaMask extension in your browser, and only then it's going to work. You have to have MetaMask installed, you have to be logged into MetaMask, and this is I'm demonstrating right now. So we have MetaMask, we have several types of uh, smart contracts, and uh, what I'm going to demonstrate in this video is how you, you can breach, uh, you can bring all this technology um, to your mobile device, to your mobile application. So the video is going to change uh, to, um, to create a mobile app out of those smart contracts. And by the way, you can share the links to your smart application. There is a desktop link for the selected app uh, down below. You can copy, you can distribute it to uh, social networks. Here's, I'm talking about all details of um, selling a free smart contract. Uh, by the way, okay. Now I'm navigating to create a mobile app out of um, this selling a free escrow contract, smart contract. So I clicked on this create mobile app and I ended up on a screen. To the right you see the screen of your mobile device and to the left you can change a few settings about how this smart contract is going to look in your mobile application. Uh, you can f change like the name of the application and here I'm going to change the icon. Oops, okay, now I'm going to change the icon. You can delete, uh, yeah, you can change the name, how it looks like. Okay, now I'm pressing the button to change the icon. I'm changing the icon of this um, mobile application. There, the icon has changed. Looks good. Uh, now I'm going to go and add more widgets, widgets to my mobile application. So far, it's just one widget for uh, one smart contract. And now I'm going to add another widget for selling the fridge again. All right, now we have two widgets in our smart, um, in, our in our mobile application. One is called selling the fridge, another one is selling the fridge again. And again, I'm changing the icon here. It's a little customization. We'll eventually add more ways to customize the look and feel of your smart contracts and mobile device. And then I'm adding the last one. All right. Okay, so we have three widgets in our mobile application, and right now, we, what we're going to do, we are going to create a mobile application. There we go. So you click this button, and you end up on the screen. So what happens here, uh, you, to download application, mobile application on your uh, mobile device, you need to do it through a link. You can get this link through scanning a QR code, getting a SMS message sent to you, or getting an email sent to, to yourself. Important part is to open the link in that email on your mobile device, as this email sent successfully, and, and now I'm going to switch from the screen to the screen of my mobile device, and you will see how it works. Okay, so here's the screen of my mobile device. I'm going to my email. Right, there is a bunch of emails. I have, um, I'm clicking on the email sent to me by 
Debs Builder, uh, and down below in the email, there is going to be a link. So there is a link, I'm going to click on it. Okay. So in this case, uh, the application was built uh, between the time I pressed this button and the time I clicked on the link. It took us maybe a minute. But occasionally you might click on this link and see how your application is being built. In this case, it happened much faster, so I'm uh, downloading this link. Uh, I have downloaded the APK, and uh, now I'm going to go through the installation steps uh, of this APK on my Android device. Yes, uh, here I'll have to jump through uh, a few security settings uh, to make sure that this application is installed. Yes, I'm going to allow install known applications from Chrome source. Okay, I allowed it, and now I have to find this application APK file again to click on it and to try to install. All right, uh, going to the downloads area. This is. Uh, this is where my application is. I'm going to click on it. All right. And I'm going to click on install. Yeah, this time I'm installing from another application again. Yes, allow. Going to this application again. Okay, one last time. Okay, all right, so the application is installing. Okay, it's installed. Now I'm going, we are going to open it and we're going to see those free smart contracts that we created through the Apps Builder in our mobile app as soon as it opens. All right, this is your mobile application having those free smart contracts that you created with uh, the Apps Builder. The icons for them are down below in the bar. Uh, eventually, you'll be able to customize where those icons are, how they look, and uh, we'll add more ways to customize the look and feel of your mobile application. But meanwhile, I'm clicking on the selling the fridge smart contract. Uh, I have to create a new wallet on my mobile device. And for wallet, needs to be protected with a password. And the password creating. There we have it. It is our selling the fringe mobile application. You can't really do it here because in this specific escrow contract um, for selling the fridge, uh, it was time limited until this block uh, number 1337214, and now it's past this block, so you, it's past the escrow time. And another smart contract, again, uh, I have to enter my password. Okay, typo, another typo. Ah. Okay, I'm going to create a new wallet here. All right, this is um, my um, next escrow contract. It's called Ceiling of the Fridge again. Depending on what your Ethereum address is, 
uh, we match it to your role. You can be a seller, buyer, or an agent in this contract, and uh, depending on your role, you can press different buttons. In this case, I'm neither. This is why I'm just looking at this uh, smart contract on my mobile device. And finally, I'm demoing the last smart contract about multi-signature wallet. So we have um, my multi-signature wallet. I can initiate sending, say, 10 Ethereums to another person. Uh, but in this case, I don't have enough gas. Okay, so here we ha I have demonstrated how you can create and mobile enable your smart contracts using the app builder. Uh, there is more to it, of course, and we are going to keep working on uh, adding more customization options, uh, adding more types of smart contracts. And of course, we're going to work on uh, adding more security controls and uh, more quality about it, specifically when it comes to identity of the users of smart contracts. This should bring our video to, to an end. Yes, I guess this is the end of the video. Um, that was a demonstration of the apps uh, builder technology. And um, now we're going to get to the slides. Okay. So, uh, like I said, you're going to get a PowerPoint presentation of uh, this, um, this presentation. You'll be able to read more about the apps uh, builder through those slides. I'm not going to torture you with uh, reading this text. It's a lot, I know. But a lot of uh, what you're going to read in this text, I have already demoed you through, the, um, through this demo. And uh, I can use the rest few minutes of the presentation to talk about uh, what we try to accomplish. Uh, like I previously mentioned, we would like to add more types of smart contracts. We started just relatively recently within the last six months. Uh, the users demand us to add more types of smart contracts, to add more options, uh, to make those smart contracts, well, smarter, more secure, to add more authentication options uh, to get into the apps builder. And uh, I can use a little time to answer your questions. Go ahead. Yes, very much. Uh, we um, draw an analogy to Wix, or we draw an analogy to WordPress. Basically, you can. Uh, you can use the apps builder to create a smart contract in a way how you can use Wix or you can use WordPress to create web pages and websites. Very well. That's a very good question. Anything else? Go ahead. Do you see this uh, mostly being used by enterprises? It will start with consumers. It will go to enterprises eventually, depending um, how quickly we'll be able to improve sophistication of those smart contracts. Because right now we cover just the basic use cases, and the basic use cases are mostly for the end users. But as soon as, uh, as we go along, as we add more types, as we deepen the options within every particular type of the smart contract, I expect us to go into enterprise as well. Or as well, we can add private solutions to the enterprise. Like if we work with uh, enterprise, we can say, hey, guys, you can build this uh, typical contract that will be available only to you, but not to general population. Anything else? Any other question? If uh, no more questions, then uh, thank you very much. I uh, welcome you all to https. Uh, https colon double slash the apps dot to learn more about the apps builder to 
uh, read our FAQ list, uh, to read our white paper, and um, I invite uh, your feedback. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. My name is Zahava Stroud, and I will be your moderator and MC for the day. I'm delighted to be the host of the first CB blockchain conference. I'm a partner with Raphael Sulentov, who you'll meet shortly, who is the founder and producer of this conference. And I'm the owner of Angel Launch. And many of you know I produce events connecting startups and investors. So I help to partner for this event today. So we're very excited to have all of you here. We also have a huge group of investors who are coming, which you'll get to meet throughout the day. So on your name tags, you'll see color-coded dots. If you have red, that means you're VIP. We do have a VIP lounge across the way where you can go today. There'll be snacks, and you can network. All speakers, presenters have that badge, as well as those who purchase the VIP badge. The other people in the room have a green or blue dot, and that will give you access to lunch today, which will be served at around 1240. And also, the cocktail party will give you free drinks. Um, and the rest of you um, are welcome to stem, come to all the programs. The Expo Hall it just does not include lunch. You're welcome to come to the cocktail party um, what we may, and have drink tickets until we run out of drink tickets. So that's the program for the day. I'd like to now introduce our general sponsor, Crypterium. We are delighted that they could be here today. They flew in all the way from Singapore. They are one of the world leaders in raising funding for ICOs. So every one of you who has an interest in this market needs to go speak with them at their booth in the Expo Hall when we're done. They have raised over 51 million, which is astounding, in tokens so far, and they are one of the top 10 leaders of ICO raises in the world. They obviously know what they're doing, and we're delighted they came on all the way from Singapore just so you could learn more about their initiatives and learn from their objectives and ideas. So we welcome their CEO. Let's give a round of applause for Mr. Austin Kim. Thank you. Oh, sorry guys, I'm without a clicker. You guys got the clicker over there? Thank you. So whilst I'm waiting for the clicker, thanks for coming. Um, the picture they chose is about 20 years old, so uh, apologies if I'm not the guy that you see on that picture. I do remember those days, but <laughs> it was a long time ago. Um, so thank you very much for the introduction. So Crypterium, um, you'll be pleased we're not going to do a presentation about an ICO that we're about to do, because we've done the ICO. What I want to talk about today is why we did the ICO and what our purpose is and what, what we're trying to achieve. And our vision is relatively straightforward. To be able to make cryptocurrency something that the whole world uses, you have to turn the cryptocurrency into a money, money that people can spend. And most of you in this room probably, well, maybe not probably, but many of you will have never actually spent a cryptocurrency. You might own some cryptocurrency, but probably you've never spent any cryptocurrency. And we want to change that. And therefore, we ran the ICO. The ICO's vision, I think, was what made it a success. Our idea is simple, to be able to spend your cryptocurrency in a real world environment. Some of the um, numbers um, our host gave us was a little bit off, but what was key was that we did have an incredible success rate in terms of the number of people who bought our tokens. I think that was because our message is very simple. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually spend this stuff that everyone calls a currency? Okay, so you're probably going to get a lot of data over the next two days, so I'm not going to bore you with a lot of data, but data does put things into perspective. So I just want to give a few bullet points out there. How many people are actually transacting with cryptocurrency on a daily basis? Ranges from three to five million, depending on who you ask. Probably most of that three to five million, however, are crypto to crypto. Very few of them are actually crypto to any form of fiat transaction. But the predict predictions for the future are quite significant. People are talking about 10% of world GDP, hundreds of millions of crypto owners. 
How do we get there, though? That's the big question. And I've put a little chart on the bottom of what the total market cap was a couple of days ago, about 350 billion. It sounds like a big number, but it's actually not a very big number. Let's have a look at where crypto fits in the world scale of money right now. So each of those little red blocks that you can see represent about $100 billion. Sounds like a lot of money, $350, $400 billion. But if you put it into perspective, if you compare it with Apple, it's about half the size of Apple's valuation, a little bit less. It's about 25% of the valuation of the 50th richest people on the planet. So we don't even match the 50 top people on the planet in the crypto space. The next set of boxes is cash, cash and coins that are in circulation. That's roughly about 5%. And then if you look at it as a percentage of world total money, crypto right now is still incredibly small. It's not this big thing that's taking over the world. It's actually quite small. And in fact, it's only less than a half a percent of the world money supply right now. Two months ago, it was about a percent. But as you know, crypto is very volatile. So now it's half a percent of the world money supply. But what that says is we're really just at the beginning. So all of this hype about Bitcoin and the price um, rises and, and falls, etc. This is only the start of it. So whether the Bitcoin is going to be 10,000, 20,000, 5,000, it won't really matter in the total scheme of things because crypto is still in its infancy. But crypto has an opportunity to change the world. And I really do mean change the world. Right now, there are approximately 2 billion people that are unbanked. There's actually, I, I read 11 million people in America, adults, that cannot get bank accounts. You know, it's not a small number of people in America, but on a global level, 2 billion people don't have bank accounts. If you don't have a bank account, you can't transact in the real world environment. You can't do business across borders. You can't do internet transactions. In Asia alone, if you ignore China, 650 million people, only 50 million of them have bank accounts. That's 600 million people in Asia that don't have bank accounts. But crypto can change that for them. Crypto, once it becomes accepted as a money, can change that for them. Those people are not necessarily, um, let's say, the poorest of the planet. They may have many reasons why they do not have a bank account. And if they want to send money from one place to another, we all know what the options are. Western Union is just one of many examples. I'm not picking on Western Union here. But if you are a migrant worker, probably working 15 hours a day, earning $200, $300, and you want to send it home, Western Union, for all their good service, are going to charge you 20% or 15%. It's big fees. They're going to end up being paid of incredibly hard-earned money. And that they don't have a choice, these people. They haven't got an option. They can't do a bank transfer because they don't have a bank account. No one wants to give them a bank account. They can't get a bank account. Now, another interesting thing is happening in the world, the mobile phone. The mobile phone, what used to be the, the smartphone. You remember, I don't know if, as I said, my picture was quite an old picture. I don't know if people remember when the first Apple phone came out and how excited you were by seeing the Apple phone. Well, now everyone's got a phone. I mean, my seven-year-old daughter had a smartphone. I mean, who's giving a seven-year-old daughter a smartphone? But I did, and probably many other people in this room are giving you know, smartphones away now like it's confetti. And the price is also coming down. What used to cost $1,000, if you buy a cheap Chinese import, maybe $100 in three years' time, that might be $30. Even that is going to be in the realms of this unbanked population. So we've got all of these people out there who can't get bank accounts and would love to transact in the real world. And we've now starting to get technology that will enable them to do some of the things that we can do for granted. And mobile phone usage and how it is being used is very different across the world. First of all, you can see on the left-hand side the predictions of how many mobile phones are going to be sold this year and next year. It's roughly 1.5 billion phones. In addition to those 1.5 billion phones that are sold, there's probably already another 5 billion phones out there. Everybody on the planet effectively can get themselves a mobile phone. On the right-hand side, what this is showing is mobile money accounts. And by this, I don't mean Apple Pay or Samsung Pay. I'm talking about people that are using the mobile phone accounts to pay bills. So they pay 
the equivalent in Africa of AT&T, whatever the leading provider is in Africa. They put $20 onto their account, and they can use their AT&T account in Africa to make a payment for something else. And as you can see in Africa, at the top one there, roughly 100 million people are making payments with their mobile phones just using a standard smartphone to make a very simple contract. And the, the, the um, growth rates are very significant. Now, when you get down to the bottom, Europe, of course, people don't need it so much. Most of the people in Europe have bank accounts. They don't need these facilities. But there's a huge group of people out there that does. And when mobile phone payments start to take over, the speed of transition can be astronomically fast. Everybody, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard of WeChat and Alipay. WeChat and Alipay dominate all Chinese commerce now. 63%, this, this is just one of many examples I could have given. It was done by Deutsche Bank, so it compares data with Germany, not the US, just because it's Deutsche Bank. But you can see 63% of all transactions that included um, clothing were in China last year went through the WeChat or the Alipay payment app on a mobile phone. It totals for the whole of China about $5 trillion compared to the USA of roughly $110 billion, 50 to 1 ratio. So once the mobile phone payment concept takes over, and of course China was one of those countries where people didn't have bank accounts, weren't able to get bank accounts, so as a result, it is taking over. Now, the advantages of cryptocurrency, we're all here, we all believe in cryptocurrency, we all think it's got a future, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And the advantages are quite clear, no borders, low fees, potentially 100 times faster in its speed. And of course, a Bitcoin or any form of cryptocurrency is the same price in the US as it is in Nicaragua or Nigeria or... India doesn't really matter. It's the same price everywhere. No longer do you have to move money into a hard currency, spend it over, then take it back out, lose 10, 15% in the process. It has lots of advantages. So why are people not using it to transact on a daily basis? Because people are not using it on a daily basis. We call it a currency, but nobody is really spending it. Now, yes, we've got security, we've got low cost, we've got speed, but on the right-hand side, and you could put your own list here, this is just me throwing out you know, a number of reasons, on the right-hand side, it's complex. You try and explain Bitcoin to your mum, you'll be there a long time before she understands it. Um, it's not that easy to get hold of. I mean, you've, these um, exchanges, very professional, but that's the problem, they're very professional. If you're, again, my mum, and you go on an exchange, you take one look at it and come straight back off it. It's not that easy. People don't trust it yet. Um, also, there's not that much awareness. People have heard of Bitcoin. How many people have heard of Dash or Ripple or any of the other currencies that are, are out there? Very few people. But I think one of the key things I want to highlight is volatility. How can anybody price in a cryptocurrency today when that's the volatility for the last seven days. It's an 18.5% swing. And if you've got one of these apps that I've got on my phone and you're regularly checking what your wallet balance looks like, well, it goes up and down quite significantly every couple of minutes. You know, if you check every minute, you've either made a 1,000 or you've lost a 1,000. You know, it's, these are big swings. So you can't expect a store to price in cryptocurrency. And secondly, which cryptocurrency? You know, there are so many of them, so how are they going to price? And what I find is quite ironic, the reason people buy most cryptocurrencies is they believe it is going to become a digital currency of the future, but the very fact of buying it and selling it is actually stopping it from being that because it's so volatile. So it's actually quite an ironic situation we find ourselves in. So how do we get from, you want to pay with what, did you say, sir? to actually saying that's no problem. We can take that currency, it's really not a problem. Now you can't expect to go from where we are today to that position in just one step. It's gonna be a many steps. Now we can move a lot of the things onto the left-hand side. We can move the simplicity, the convenience. They will all come better over time. I think volatility is gonna stick there for a long time. Unfortunately, we're gonna to have to live with the volatility for quite a long time. 
Well, what is important to me is the number and the volume of digital currencies that people are actually going to get access to. Now, this chart just shows Bitcoin as a percentage of the total crypto market. Of course, when it, 2015, it was the, the only real cryptocurrency out there. Now it's about 40% of the market. And the thing that Crypterium believes in is not that Bitcoin is going to be this thing that's going to change the world. It's actually this box that I name other that is what's going to change the world. Because Bitcoin, as I said, it's complex. Not everybody understands it. Um, it's not that easy to access. But the other is actually going to change that. Now, some of you will have seen the chart I'm about to show. It's a video. It's a very clever video. I cut off the first. Oops, maybe I can go back. I was hoping. Guys, can you play the video for me at the back? There we go. So what you can see now is the altcoins, the alt tokens. Now, again, forgive me if you've seen this, this video. I missed off the first two years. It doesn't really add much. There was not much happening in the first two years. But this is the other box that was really quite critical. Lots of ICOs out there all creating their own individual um, tokens. But most of those tokens have a utility value. They are being created for a specific purpose. Now, this is the explosion that has taken place in the last, effectively, six months. So we are at the start of something very, very big. Um, there's some big names in there. Some of you may have bought tokens within those big names. But why do I show this? It's because these are the things that your mum, your dad, my son, my daughter, may well end up owning, not because they went out to buy cryptocurrency as some form of investment, but because it has a utility purpose that they want. And I'm going to give one example. <coughs> Playchip. Playchip is probably a, an ICO that you don't know. I mention it because I think it's got the potential to be the biggest, um, let's see, ICO that is going to impact people. Um, in the next few months. Now, we've done an alliance with Playchip. That our, their tokens will be on our platform. But why am I excited by Playchip? Playchip is in the gaming industry. Now, almost every conference you'll go to, there will be gamers out there that are talking about how they're going to move what is already a digital currency inside the gaming environment into a cryptocurrency that you can buy and sell on exchanges. Now, gaming industry has hundreds of millions of users. This particular company, Playchip, is working with um, enthusiasts um, gaming, and they have 100 million discrete users every single month. Now, those users, when they want to play on this platform, will have to buy the Playchip token. No longer will they just be buying their equivalent of Candy Crush tokens to get a few free lives. They'll be buying Playchip tokens. And those tokens will move between platform to platform. But every gamer eventually wants to cash out. It's the same with loyalty programs. Now, the loyalty program of yesterday was only use it on the one airline. Now, today, we know that those um, loyalty programs, you can buy luggage, you can maybe buy them a, a theme park ride, you can do all sorts with them. But the next evolution is that they become digital tokens that people can spend either in that environment or they can exchange them. So what is going to happen in the next 18 months, two years, is all these people who right now do not understand what a cryptocurrency is or how it works, are actually going to start to own some because they have a utility purpose on another, on another company. Now, I can carry on about Playchip. It's not so important to, to talk about its features, but there are video websites out there that are going to now pay you in cryptocurrency for uploading content, gaming websites that are going to pay you to play games, Survey websites that are going to pay you in crypto to do a survey. And the list goes on and on and on. And all of these are cryptocurrencies. So when you combine mobile technology, which pretty much everybody can afford and will work, with utility nature tokens that everybody on the street will actually start to own, not because they went out as an investor, but because they happened to shop at Sears or they happened to play a game online. They've got $20, $30 worth of cryptocurrency in their pocket. And then you integrate that with an existing payment infrastructure. We have the Visa, we have the MasterCard, we have the um, UnionPay in China. 
Um, I list two here, which we are integrating with, Lukova um, up in Canada and Liquid Pay in Asia. Liquid Pay, for example, has 500,000 payment terminals across Asia. And you'll be able to use our application on their payment terminals to spend this cryptocurrency that people will be acquiring. Combine those three things together, and suddenly cryptocurrency starts to have a real world use. So how do we do it? So what we enable you to do as a customer, and we're not the only one, there will be others out there, but we will be the first that can actually do it the way I'm presenting, what we will enable you to do is through your mobile phone to be able to spend all those currencies that I've just talked about in a real world environment. So you start off with your digital wallet. Nothing particularly clever about this digital wallet, it's a digital wallet. Um, it has your cryptocurrency in it. Um, you use your mobile phone. You go to Starbucks and you go to Starbucks with your mobile phone and Starbucks says that's $5 for your coffee. You touch your phone to the terminal and you say, I'd like to pay in play chip tokens, please. Now, if you said that to Starbucks, they're gonna laugh at you, but you don't need to say that because we are gonna do the process behind the scenes. Starbucks doesn't want play chip, doesn't want Bitcoin, it wants $5. And that's what the terminal will ask for. Now, as with any payment transaction, it will go to a bank. The bank that issued the payment card, or for example, in liquid pay, the payment um, point of sale platform. And the bank will say, well, we don't know. We'll ask Cryptarium, should we authorize this or not? Now, Cryptarium is constantly measuring how much your wallet has in fiat currency, whether that be dollar, euro, rupee, it doesn't really matter. So we're constantly valuing it, and we know to say yes or no. If we say yes, then we actually use fiat currency. We have a fiat currency pool of money that will pay MasterCard, the bank issuer, $5 and the bank pays $5 to Starbucks. It's a very simple process. Now, inside this, of course, we are buying and selling crypto assets from the customer. But the customer is actually doing a transaction in real time in Starbucks, and Starbucks receives money. Now, the other thing we do is we are able to avoid the fees. Not all of the fees, but most of the fees. If you've ever done a Bitcoin transaction, you know it costs roughly between $3 and $10, depending on the day you use it. So no one's gonna spend $5 for a $5 coffee and then pay another $5 on top for the transaction. But we do basically a master account and we scrape all the accounts at once and we do one $5 transaction. We don't do 5,000 $5 transactions. So we effectively eliminate the fee for the purposes of the customer. Now for this, we do charge the customer a small fee, half a percent in our token. But ultimately, it's a very small price to pay to be able to use that cryptocurrency that you got when you played on the game in Starbucks or McDonald's. So ultimately, it's a fiat-to-fiat -fiat transaction, and we have obviously a bid offer um, element to it. The more volatile the currency, the bigger the bid offer spread is gonna be. The lower the volatility, the lower that spread will be. So it's actually a very simple process. Now, the technology behind it is not simple, but for you as a customer, the process is actually quite simple. You tap your phone, Starbucks says five bucks, you pay with Playchip, and the whole deal is done. So I'm gonna wrap up now. Um, just what is the purpose of this presentation? The purpose is to explain how we are going to go from $350 billion worth of crypto money into an environment where it is real money in a real world situation where your mom and dad and your kids and your auntie and uncle and everybody's got some crypto and they have a way to spend it. So everyday people start to use tokens in a real world environment. We will all get some at some point, even if we didn't understand how we got them. Token owners will look for ways to actually spend that token outside the environment. As the same way with the Ermiles programs had to move out of just buying flights to being able to buy bottles of wine or whatever else, it'll be exactly the same here. I may have $100 worth of a particular store's token, but I don't want to go back to that store. I'd quite like to spend it on the meal that I'm doing tonight. No problem, we can actually do that conversion. And people will start to look for ways to spend it. The more tokens are used and spent, the more people will feel comfortable with it. If I know I can spend a token, 
then I'm also relaxed about receiving a token. Now, of course, the exchanges will create different values, etc. But today, if I said to you, can I pay you in Bitcoin? You might say, okay, I know exactly how much your Bitcoin is worth, but it's still a hassle. But if I said to you of one of those other 1,500 tokens out there, you're probably gonna say no. But if you know you can spend it, then you might say yes. So our simple logic is, we are not waiting for the world to accept Bitcoin or Ripple or Dash or whatever is gonna be the big winner out there in the crypto world to take over and people starting to get their salaries in Bitcoin. We are expecting and almost certain that almost everybody who has any form of real world transactions is gonna to start to own crypto and they're gonna to want to spend it. And once you can start to spend it, then it starts to have a general level of acceptance and that's what we do. Okay, that's it. I am finished. I'm happy to take any questions or I'm also happy to sit down and let someone else speak. Yes? Can you speak a bit louder? Sorry, it's a long way. That is a very good point. I mean, of course, if something is cre um, treated as a security. Okay, so the question was, if the cryptocurrency is counted as a security, then how are you actually solving the um, trading elements of actually now trading in a security rather than actually trading in a currency? Now, that is a very good point. Now, obviously we have a more expert person coming up on the stage directly after me who might well answer this question a lot better than I'm gonna answer it. But not every token will be counted as a security. If it is a security, then probably we will stay clear of it to start with. Now, what makes it a security, unfortunately, is a little bit unclear right now. And also, everybody in this room is probably only thinking about the USA, because you're in the USA. We're not just thinking of the USA, we're also thinking of every other market in the world. So Japan, for example, treats it as currency. Singapore has come out recently and said it's gonna treat it as, as currency. China, who knows what's gonna happen with China? They may come out and say it's a currency or a security. But clearly not every single crypto token or cryptocurrency is gonna be counted as a security. Now, if it is a security, of course, there's a whole new world that we have to live in. But until that world is made clear, we're still gonna go down this path and be careful which ones we pick. We won't allow 2,000 tokens on our platform. We will only allow those tokens which we believe fit with our um, environment. First of all, it has to be liquid. It has to sit on three or four exchanges um, and it has to have, in our opinion, a utility value that is actually adding some real world. So it's a good question, but until we have clarity from the SEC and other markets, then we can't answer it, unfortunately. Yes, at the back. Okay, the, it's not really the customer that needs to worry about it, it's more the bank issuer that needs to worry about it. So what we have is this process whereby we have a virtual Visa card or a virtual MasterCard or a virtual Union Pay card, doesn't matter, inside the digital wallet. And that virtual card has a zero balance. It's got zero balance. It's not that we're putting a 3,000 credit card in there, it's a zero balance card. When the transaction goes to Starbucks and it goes to the bank, the bank knows it's a zero balance card. So they will check two things simultaneously. They will check first with us that we are prepared to authorize the payment. And secondly, there is a fiat settlement account that sits inside that bank so the bank knows when they authorize it, the money is sitting there for them to actually recover their cost. So from a issuing perspective, the bank has two checks. One, Cryptarium says yes, and two, the money is sitting there. And the bank can withdraw that money from the fiat settlement account either instantaneously or more likely at the end of every single day. Now for the customer, we have a smart contract. And effectively what we do is we do two transactions at the same time, although from a legal perspective, one is before the other. And the one that's before the other is we say to you as a customer, 
we would like to buy some crypto from you. And we'd like to buy crypto worth $5 worth of the crypto that you are interested in selling. And we make that purchase. And we put a smart contract marker on your account that says, $5 of your crypto that you were happy to sell to us now belongs to us. So we have security that we, we own that. We also know that we wouldn't authorize it unless you had enough money. And the bank has security that the uh, fiat currency is sitting there. So everybody in this process has basically some form of level of security. The only, let's say, risk in this equation is that two or three minutes that we will be living with in the exchange between the crypto and the fiat currency on some form of an exchange. And that's why we have to have a bid offer spread. Um, in the same way any other bank will detect on money laundering. I mean, actually, I mean, this is a common question, but um, what we are doing is we're allowing people to use a mobile phone in a Starbucks. Now, maybe money laundering will be used to buy Starbucks coffee, but I think it's much more down a, a, another end of the equation. So our cards are zero balance cards. They're not going to be for buying a Ferrari or buying a house. They're buying for you know day-to-day -day transactions. So we have, as an advance to KYC and AML procedures, as any leading bank today. Um, you know, if you've been to any of these conferences, there are many companies out there that are doing fantastic work. We do all that up front. And then, as I say, in, in a real world environment, okay, maybe there's money laundering for a coffee or a TV, but it's you know, the type of business that we're aiming at. We're not aiming at the million dollar transactions. We're aiming at the $10, $20 daily transactions. So. Yep, yourself. Yes. You know, that that's really is a good question, but it's not actually one I can answer for you right now because, of course, data is in the press right now because of Facebook and all those other things um, taking place. Um, we have been, let me, I, I didn't explain. We were a payments platform before we became Cryptarium. So we, we've been working with um, fiat currency payments for the last four years. We do transactions on every single day. We did, I think, 400,000 transactions last year on a, a, using a, a payments platform. We do not use that data at this point in time for anything other than confirming the customer and the payment. So we're not using, let's say, this metadata that we could be using. How we use it in the future is going to be really governed, I think, by what is acceptable use um, by the marketplace. Now, we will own data because we see the transaction. And we will also have data on a particular um, chip. How we use that, we have never really given it much thought. We don't see it as being a monetization issue for us. We only see it as a um, means to better, let's say, target the right customer base. But it, it really is a fantastic question. But we have no intention right now of using it for monetary purposes. Yeah, what, what we offer um, the customer is different pricing strategies, or not, let's say payment strategies. So if you go on various exchanges, depending on the volatility of the currency, you're going to have a swing between 5 and minus 5%. Now, Bitcoin probably is within half a percent each direction, but some of these other tokens may well have significant swings. So that's why we need to be on three or four exchanges. So we can't work with a token that is only on one exchange. In um, fact, we are about to be a token that is only on one exchange when we launch on HitBTC on Monday. But we will launch on other, to on other exchanges because our customers need to buy our tokens to use our platform. So you have to have a utility nature to the token. And in our opinion, if you have a utility nature of the token, you can't just be on one exchange. You have to be on a whole range of exchanges. You can't limit the customer. So we have... Built, we're working with a third party right now to build algorithms that reflect both the volatility and the liquidity of the token. Um, now, you as a customer can say, I would like to mix my tokens in a purchase. I'd like a little bit of um, play chip and a little bit of Bitcoin. 
and I want it in the following ratio is dependent on pricing strategies. So what we confirm to the customers, we will not be further away than the average by some mathematical mean. But for us as a company, the average actually gives us an opportunity to cover our risk. So let's say you as an individual, you can get a dollar price, and that's the fixed average, but we might be able to get it for a dollar five or sell it for 95. And we do that. So we give you effectively the average, which is fair market price, and then within the volatility, we take advantage of the difference. Yes, sir, at the back. Now, we will have servers in every single country that we operate, so we, many countries have all sorts of rules. Now, the predecessor to us, as I said, is a payment system called PayQR. PayQR is one of the leading payment platforms in Russia. People will look at that and say, oh, well, it's Russia, maybe it's, it's got more you know, risk. Actually, there's less risk, because the rules you have to apply in Russia are tighter than almost anywhere else, because the whole world watches Russia. So if you're doing a payments platform in Russia, your anti-money laundering and all these things have to be perfect. And also, you have to make sure the data doesn't flow outside the country, and it has to sit in certain locations. So we will follow those rules on a country-by-country -country basis. Now, I want to... Um, say that what I've presented today isn't yet live. We don't go live for two months. So the question you're asking is, how will we do it? Um, and rather than how do we do it? And as I say, we will make sure that we are containing the information within the boundaries that that particular country allows us to do. And every country is different. I mean, the UK is, allows you to do it around Europe, for example, whereas the US and Russia will have completely different rules. Is that it? My time is up, sorry guys. Um, I have no problems with people get, taking a copy of the deck if, it's, okay. if it, it can be distributed. So what we will do after the show is we can collect decks from any presenters that agree for release, and we'll put them up and send you all links so you can download them to make it easy. Let's give a round of applause to thank Austin Kim. Thank, thank you, you guys. very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, can you... Um All right, so next we are thrilled to have um, Nadia Brannon from the SEC. She works in the Compliance Division and Enforcement, and she's going to tell you some of the latest trends that you need to know. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for having me. My name is Nadia Brennan. I'm a, um, an examiner with the Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations. So actually, I have nothing to do with enforcement. Um, I have to start with the standard disclosure. Um, that The thoughts that I'm bringing to you today are those of my own, and not necessarily of the commission, the commissioners, or my colleagues on the staff of the commission. Uh, my office, the Office of Compliance, runs SEC's examination program. And basically what we do, we examine people that are registered with the SEC um, and that are regulated with us um, to make sure that um, we improve compliance, prevent fraud, monitor risk, and inform policy. The results of the NEP examinations are used uh, by SEC to inform rulemaking, identify and monitor risks, improve industry practices, and pursue misconduct. So what I'm going to do today is I'll talk a little bit about the promise of blockchain, then I'll explain the role of SEC in this space. Um, I'll talk about the recent public statements by SEC and also recent ICO-related enforcement matters. And finally, I'll talk about our examination process. It is absolutely impossible to disagree with my predecessor speakers about the potential, the transformative potential of the blockchain technology and the distributed ledger technology. It has a broad range of applications in a variety of industries, including digital identity, distributed computing and file storage, digital media rights, 
um, healthcare records management, supply chain management. There have been implementations in pharmaceuticals, food components, just to make the, a few. And certainly these technologies can transform capital markets um, and securities industries in a way that we can't today imagine. From equity issuance and trading to loan syndication and report transaction facilitation, from smart agreement implementation for credit default swaps to creation of central repository of standard reference data for all products. And it can bring the unprecedented transparency to the market and to the regulators. Many large financial institutions are actively working on blockchain technologies. Um, Hyperledger announced their release pretty recently. Um, yesterday, I think news were around go what Google is doing in the blockchain space. In December of 2015, the first security was issued using blockchain technology, chain.com on NASDAQ link. A year later, OSTAC.com issued the first, was the first company to issue their stock in blockchain format only. Now I'll talk a little bit about SEC mission. When the stock market crashed in 1929, so did the public confidence in U.S. markets. Congress held hearing to identify the problems and search for solutions. Based on its findings, Congress, in the peak of the Great Depression, passed the Securities Act of 1933. The following year, it passed the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, which created Securities and Exchange Commission. The main purpose of these laws can be reduced to two common sense notions. Number one, companies offering securities for sale to the public must tell the truth about their business. The, the securities that they are selling and the risks involved in investing in those securities. And number two, those who sell and trade securities, brokers, dealers, and exchanges, must treat investors fairly and honestly. The SEC has a three-part mission. Number one, to facilitate capital formation. Number two, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets. And number three, to protect investors. And we work really hard to balance all three of these goals. A fundamental tenet of our regulatory framework is that an offer or, say, um, or sale of securities in the United States must comply with United States securities laws. This approach has been critical to maintaining market integrity and fostering investor protection for over 80 years including through various technological changes. This issue of whether a particular investment opportunity involves offer or sale of security, regardless of terminology or technology used in the transaction, depends on the facts and circumstances, including economic realities of the business. And if um, an offer is a security, it has to be registered with SEC and comply with periodic disclosure obligations. Or qualify for an exemption from registration, such as Section 4A2, Regulation D, Rule 504, 506B, 506C, Regulation C, uh, Regulation Crowdfunding, or Regulation A. We at SEC have been closely following the evolution of the blockchain ecosystem, as well as the developments in ICO space, token insurances and offerings of cryptocurrency-related products. Some time ago, we created an intra-agency distributed ledger technology working group to specifically focus on the development of, in this arena, and I belong to that um, group. 
Um, the group also assists in coordination with our federal, state, and local regulatory and law enforcement partners and liaising with the industry. Since the explosion of ICOs in 2017, the SEC has taken a series of steps to inform the public and players in the crypto market about the risks in this arena. Last summer, the SEC issued a report of investigation, or so-called 21A report, that has come to be known as DAO, or DAO report. It stated that tokens offered and sold by a virtual organization known as the DAO were securities under the Howey test, and therefore subject to federal securities laws. The report, the report confirmed that issuers of distributed ledger or black, blockchain technology-based securities must register offers and sales of such securities unless a valid exemptive relief is available. Those participating in unregistered offerings also may be liable of violations of the securities laws. Additionally, Dow said that securities exchanges providing for trading of these securities must register unless they're exempt. Um, so just do you know, Howey test is a 1946 case that defined that investment contract um, and, that is, and thus the security is an investment of money in common enterprise with reasonable expectation of profit and to be derived from entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. Shortly after the Dow report, Commission issued an investor alert regarding public companies making ICO-related claims. Alert highlighted several trading suspensions on the common stock of certain issues who made claims regarding their investment in ICOs or touted coin or token related news. The companies affected by trading suspensions include First Bitcoin Capital Corp, CIAO Group, Strategic Global, and Sunshine Capital. Uh, Alert further warned consumers about various forms of microcap fraud, including pump and dump schemes. In November, SEC issued a statement urging caution around celebrity-backed ICOs. It specifically warned celebrity endorsements that celebrity endorsements may be unlawful if they do not disclose the nature, source, and amount of any compensation paid, directly or indirectly, by the company in exchange for the endorsement. A failure to disclose this information is a violation of anti-touting provisions of United States securities laws. Persons making these endorsements may also be liable for potential violations of anti-fraud provisions of the federal securities laws for participating in the unregistered offer and sale of securities and for acting as unregistered broker. And finally, on uh, December 11th, Chairman of SEC, um, Jay Clayton, issued a public statement we, in which he, addressed, which he addressed to both Main Street investors as well as professionals such as broker-dealers, inve um, investment advisors, exchanges, lawyers, and accountants. He warned investors about lack of protection in cryptocurrency markets as compared to the, to the traditional securities markets. Chairman Clayton further noted, and I'm quoting verbatim, Following the issuance of 21A report, 
certain market professionals have attempted to highlight utility characteristics of their proposed ICOs in an effort to claim that their proposed tokens or coins are not securities. Many of these assertions appear to elevate form over substance. Merely calling a token a utility token or structuring it to provide some utility doesn't prevent the token from being a security. Tokens and offerings that incorporate features and marketing efforts that emphasize the potential for profits based on entrepreneurial and or managerial efforts of others continue to be the hallmark of United States security laws. A message to gatekeepers was equally strong. Gatekeepers and others, including the securities lawyers, accountants, and consultants, need to focus on their responsibilities. Selling securities generally requires a license, and experience shows that excessive touting in thinly traded and volatile markets can be the indication of scalping, pump and dump, and other manipulations and frauds. And most recently, on May 7th, SEC issued a statement on potentially unlawful online platforms and trading digital assets. Basically what it said is that a platform that trades securities and operates as an exchange as defined by the federal securities laws must register as a national securities exchange or operate under an exemption, such as the exemption provided for um, ATSs or alternative trading systems under um, SEC regulation ATS. SEC registered national um, security exchange might have rules to prevent fraud and manipulation. Um, as self-regulatory organization, an SEC registered national securities exchange must also have rules and procedures governing the, dis the discipline of its members and persons associated with its members and enforce compliance by its members with the federal securities laws and the rules of the exchange. And finally, the National Sec Securities Exchange must itself comply with the federal securities laws and must file its rules with SEC. Um, on the other hand, the entity seeking to operate as an ATS must register with SEC as a broker-dealer and become a member of a self-regulatory organization, such as an exchange. Um, registration as a broker-dealer subjects the ATS to a host of regulatory requirements. Um, they have to have reasonable policies and procedures to prevent the misuse of material non-public information, a books and records requirement, and financial responsibility rules, including um, requirements concerning the safeguarding and custody of customer funds and securities. An ATS must comply with, with federal securities laws and the SRO rules as well, and file form ATS with the SEC. Some online trading platforms may not meet the definition of um, an exchange, but directly or indirectly offer trading or other services related to digital assets that are securities, thus triggering other regulatory requirements under federal securities laws, including broker-dealer, transfer agent, or clearing agency registration, among other things. People also need to make sure that they are not participating in the unregistered offer and sale of securities. Um, full text of all of these public statements that I just mentioned are available on the SEC website, which has a section specifically focused on um, ICOs, 
um, and the address is www.sac.gov slash ICOs. Um, I encourage you to spend some time um, looking at the information there. It has a lot of educational materials. Um, take a look at, um, at this slide next to me. Um, it basically boils down the, the view of SEC on ICOs to five simple points. Number one, ICOs can be security offerings. They may need to be registered. Tokens sold in ICOs can be called many things, but merely calling a token a utility token or structuring it to provide some utility does not prevent a token from being a security. ICOs may pose substantial risks to investors. While some ICOs may be attempts to honest investment opportunities, many may be frauds. They may also present substantial risks for loss or manipulation, including through hacking, with little recourse for victims after the fact. And we encourage investors to ask questions before blindly investing. So now a few um, words about our enforcement efforts. Late last year, SEC's Division of Enforcement created a cyber unit, uh, which is focused on enforcement of several areas, such as cyber hacking and related trading, insider trading, account intrusion and disclosures, digital currencies, and initial coin offerings. SEC has filed a handful of cases on ICOs to date, and more involving related issues like Bitcoin, Ponzi schemes, and like. So in September of um, September 29, 2017, SEC filed an emergency action in, Eastric, and in Easter, Eastern District of New York to stop an ICO evolving the sale of securities in connection with the sale of RE coin and diamond tokens. Um, stated purpose of the token was that they would use, uh, that they would be used to purchase real estate and diamonds. Investors would participate in appreciation of the value of the token as the company's businesses grew um, uh, using the managerial efforts of experts retained by the company. Offering was promoted on the company's own website and also on Reddit. The, re the reality, however, was that tokens, in fact, did not exist. The purported team of experts that would identify underlying real estate supporting the tokens did not exist. And defendants could not pay returns because they didn't have any real estate operations. In the case called Manchi last December, the Commission expanded on its analysis of token as security. The Manchi token was styled as a utility token because it would eventually allow users to participate in an app-based ecosystem where users could receive tokens in exchange for writing reviews and could spend them at participating restaurants. The restaurants would review, will reward visitors with tokens or pay the tokens for advertising on the platform or something like that. Munchie's white paper invoked Howey test and claimed that tokens were not securities. But the order discussed a number of other factors that led the commission to conclude that the token was a security. I'll run through a few of those so you'll have a flavor of what um, we are looking at and understand a little bit um, about what we consider when we assert our jurisdiction. The token was marketed as investment that would increase in value as a result of Munchie's efforts in, development, in developing the platform. Keep in mind, as I read this, that the Howey test is whether purchasers are investing money in a common enterprise with an expectation of profits to be derived from the entrepreneurial efforts of others. 
So these, this seems to qualify right there. Manchi also created a limited supply of tokens and told potential purchasers that it would per periodically burn them, which would increase the value of the remaining tokens. Again, expectation of profit. The token had no functional utility at the time of the token sale because the platform has not been developed. Purchasers were effectively buying into a common enterprise to create a network or a platform, not merely getting entitlement to participate in the network or platform, um, the equivalent of software license or something like that. The token was marketed to the crypto community generally, or crypto-oriented websites, not to restaurants, diners, or potential users of the platform. This also makes it look more like investment than any kind of utility. And finally, Manchi represented that it would ensure that its token was available on secondary exchanges. It also said that it would buy or sell tokens to ensure liquidity in those secondary markets. Again, looks more like an investment. Um, in late January, Another emergency action was filed by SEC, this time in the Northern District of Texas. A rice bank offered securities in the form of its own crypto token. Um, they claimed to have uh, raised over $600 million. A rice bank claimed to be the world's first decentralized bank, allegedly offering a variety of consumer-facing products and services and supporting more than 700 different virtual currencies. The reality, however, was that a rice bank falsely claimed to have purchased a 100-year-old commercial bank and that it could offer customers FDIC-issued accounts and transactions. It falsely claimed that it could offer an Arise Bank-branded Visa card. It also failed to disclose the criminal background of key executives, including the co-founder and CEO, who is currently on probation for felony theft and tampering with government records. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, in the most recent case, SEC versus John Mantrol and Bitfinder, the commission charged a former Bitcoin-denominated platform um, and its operator with the operations and, um, and uh, sorry, for operating an unregistered securities exchange and defrauding its users. Um, just to, to recap, um, today I talked about the promise of the blockchain, explained the role of SEC, talked about recent public statements by the SEC, and also summarized recent ICO-related enforcement cases. I skipped the section on examinations. Um, to sum it all up, innovation in the area of blockchain have tremendous potential. We welcome and encourage the appropriate use of technology to facilitate capital formation and provide investors with new investment opportunities. We are particularly hopeful that innovation in this area will facilitate fair and efficient capital raising for small businesses. However, it is important to make sure that the disruptive nature of the industry do not pose open opportunities for fraud and ultimately harm the investing public. Only through an open dialogue and by working together, we increase the odds of success for entrepreneurs and the strong protection of investors, which is essential to the success and future of this ecosystem. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I probably, I won't take the questions. Um, however, I will stay. Want to take one? Or we, do you have um, to, oh, okay, so one thing I just wanted to also yeah. mention that also, oh, there we go, uh, right behind me, um, there is an address for a dedicated uh, email box that we created at SEC Fintech 
at SEC.gov for public to, com to communicate with SEC. So feel free to send your questions and requests there. And I will stay for the rest of the conference, so I will be right. more than happy to answer questions. All right, let's give a round of applause. Thank Nadia Brannan. Um, for the next panel, the speakers should be mic'd up in the very back, so please come to the stage if you have your mic. It's a panel on investing capital in this market. So if you don't have your mic and you're on the panel, please get your mic. If not, come to the stage. And thank you very much, Nadia Brannan. Okay, um, while they're coming up to the stage, I wanted to mention again that we have different color coding tickets. If you have a color circle, that means that you will get lunch in the expo hall during lunch. The rest of you are welcome to come, but will not get lunch. And we also, if you have red or you're a speaker or presenter, you can go into the VPI lounge, which will have snacks in the afternoon and also for a more intimate networking with investors that will be available. And then we will have um, a lunch break for about 40 minutes in the expo hall next door where you eat lunch and meet many of our exhibitors today. We also have a cocktail party. We hope you will all join us next door from 5.30 to 7 at the end of the day. Okay, and so now we'll get ready for the uh, next panel. Um, okay, I guess it is just okay. two of you. Okay, so do we have any more of the panelists for the next panel here? Okay. Guess not. All right, well, we'll start with the two we have, and we'll see if we can find the others. Um, let's see. Let me, let me see. Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are still awake. Um, there's more coffee next door if you need it. Uh, my name is Jim Maricondo, and I work for Consensus on the Global Business Development Solutions Team. I'm not sure if you heard of Consensus. We're a venture production studio founded by Joseph Lubin, one of the creators of Ethereum. And our mission is to spread blockchain and decentralized technologies into as much of the world as possible. Everything from government to enterprise, um, education, pretty much you name it. And so I appreciate being given the opportunity to moderate the panel today. We've got a couple distinguished VCs here. Um, I've got a few topics which I um, want to discuss, um, but before we do that, maybe I could have a brief poll. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could raise your hand in the audience if you identify yourself as an investor. You can define investor, but a few of them. Um, who, who actually has invested in an ICO? Um, all right, and keep your hands raised if you're actually an accredited investor. Just, just wondering. <laughs> um, okay, still, still a, a, a good overlap of those regions. Okay, so uh, we're kind of down to a bit of a smaller panel right now, but I'd like to start with maybe um, a brief intro, and maybe you could answer just how long you've been investing in, in blockchain startups. Um, please go ahead. Sure. Hi, I'm Bernard Moon. I'm co-founder of uh, Spark Labs Group. We're a network of accelerators in Asia. And then we also have uh, a few venture capital funds. I'm more full-time on our global seed stage fund called Spark Labs Global. Uh, we recently launched uh, Spark Chain, which is a blockchain-focused fund. Uh, that's led by Joyce Kim, the co-founder of Stellar. Uh, so I'm the one with the lesser experience. Uh, we've been investing in this space since 2014. Our first investment was in a company out of Stockholm called Cryx which was a F F FX cryptocurrency exchange. And then um, also out of our accelerator in Seoul, uh, we invested in a company called Blocko in 2015, which is now the leading enterprise blockchain company in Korea. And also Senpi in 2015, which is the leading Bitcoin remittance company in, in South Korea. And then recently out of our uh, global seed fund, we invested in Masari, which is trying to be sort of a crunch base slash Edgar online in the crypto space. Uh, Gamma, which is a crypto mining slash online gaming play. Uh, and then a couple others. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Um. I'm a co-founder and managing director of TransLink Capital based in Palo Alto. It's too bad uh, our fellow panelists couldn't join us today because I think our preference would be to have a more diverse perspective. Bernard and I are really close friends and we do a lot of work together in Korea, so you'll only see a little bit of a bias there. Uh, but my day job, uh, I've been on the venture capital side for about 18 years. Um, uh, I started my career at a firm called Vertex uh, Management, which is the venture capital arm of the Singapore headquarter Tomasic Group. 
And we were fund investors in all the top funds uh, from Sequoia and about the remaining 40 or so from there. And we would invest in later stage opportunities uh, to help the companies expand internationally. Uh, while I was doing that, I was recruited by Samsung in 2003 to start and lead Samsung Ventures here in the US. Um, and then in 2007, I left Samsung to start TransLink with a couple of very close friends who had also been on the corporate side, uh, one a Japanese gentleman, another a Taiwanese gentleman. And collectively, uh, we used to represent firms like SoftBank, Foxconn, Samsung, et cetera. And what we do is we connect US-based innovative startup companies to their customers and partners in Asia, specifically across Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. And we work closely with the larger technology companies out there. Uh, my involvement on the blockchain side uh, happened uh, in 2013 when one of the entrepreneurs that I had a relationship with uh, connected, uh, approached me with an interesting business plan to connect Korea to the Bitcoin world. And that was a company called Corbit that was the first crypto exchange in Korea. And for those, obviously, who follow uh, the crypto market, um, Korea has been a huge market for uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, about a third of the households nationally have trading accounts. The trading volume on a daily basis has exceeded the regular stock market equivalent uh, on the trades. And so the government had to intervene and so on. Um, so as part of that investment in Corbett, I've been involved in a number of ICOs of the past uh, nine months or so, um, ranging from uh, Korea-based uh, projects like Icon and more locally-based projects like uh, B Token, mm -hmm. Referium, and then also have uh, invested in some more global ambitious projects like Telegram, and just had some exposure on that side um, to be able to kind of compare and contrast with traditional venture funding and ICOs. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen uh, an explosion in, in ICOs and tokens these days. How, would, how do you guys evaluate a good opportunity? And maybe you could take it both from the perspective of a VC as well as uh, like an, a, an individual ICO investor. Um. Well, I'm probably in the minority. I, I think we as a firm have been very sort of conservative within this space and approach, even uh, on our Spark chain side. I, I think we've been sort of saying publicly since last summer that uh, eventually utility tokens has to be tied to equity in some form or manner. And I think we've seen that movement since, even though it's taken a while. Uh, we've seen it also first in, since we have footprint in China, Korea, Japan, we saw those regulatory bodies move first, and then now the US. So when we look at an ICO, I think it's almost like a, you know, we will consider it. Uh, and some of our partners have done it more personally. Uh, but as a firm, we sort of see it as a double home run. Like it's hard enough to launch our startup product. Then second, it's hard enough to, uh, you know, build an ecosystem around it. So we're definitely the minority, I think, in this space. Um, so I think, again, this is why it would have been helpful to have a more diverse <laughs> panel. Uh, I think our perspectives um, are very similar to Bernard's. Um, if you really think about it, uh, while there's a lot of excitement around ICOs, it really is a financing event. And the financing event, as we all know, is the beginning of the process to actually deliver a product or a platform or a service and then market that product platform service, generate revenue, and create value. And the reality is uh, not a lot of teams, quite frankly, are necessarily built out to complete that entire process. There does seem to be um, a trend where some of uh, the ICOs, not all of them, but some of the ICOs, uh, have a little bit more of a short-term perspective. Let's get the money first, and we'll figure out things later. And, and those are the projects that I think um, have the risk to run into trouble, uh, because if they don't necessarily have the right team from an engineering or technical background, nor necessarily the business experience to expand that and build out their business on that, then a lot of these ICO proceeds will be churned in and wasted. And I think we've all heard stories about you know, waste and fraud and whatnot with the ICO proceeds. 
Um, and so those are the type of projects we tend to avoid, or at least try to. And at the end of the day, what we're really looking for is a combination of things that, as venture capitalists, we look for in equity investments. We're looking for an experienced, solid team that are going after a large opportunity in a space that they're familiar with and have proven the capability to execute on that. And while the ICO bubble seems to be somewhat bursting with the support of Nadia and the SEC early on, um, I do think that the back to the basics principle is happening right now. Uh, you'll see experienced entrepreneurs evaluating the possibility, the pros and cons of an ICO versus an equity raise. And some of them have decided to move away from the ICO track back to an equity raise. Others are already pursued, uh, pursue, proceeding with that, but they're doing it in a much more measured, de deliberate, careful way to make sure that everything is legit and focusing really on knowledgeable, accredited investors that could potentially add value, which is again very similar to how startups raise venture capital anyway. Yeah, I just realized that our comments might not be helpful for, for those of you that are obviously actively looking at ICOs, so I'll just sort of add a little more color to it. I mean, if I were to look at an ICO and invest in, I would do it sort of the same way as any seed stage investor does it. I would not invest in a company that just has a white paper, no product. I mean, unless they are a successful sort of repeat entrepreneur with a track record. Um, if they're not, and they don't have that background, then definitely dive into the product and look at the traction that they have. And you could just search online and see sort of regular comps. Like, even at the seed stage, a lot of you know, e-commerce startups might not even get seed funding, funding from investors unless they have like, you know, at least like half million in, in revenue organically. I mean, there's certain benchmarks that you guys could look at, just like any other seed stage investor would. I would just do that and, and, and be smart about your investments. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Bernard and Jay. Uh, just to summarize a bit, yeah, personally, you know, we, what I think is we've seen this uh, now effect of having instant liquidity. Um, you know, the tokens become tradable in most cases right after the ICO, but maybe like, like our panelists said, they don't even have a product yet or have they even had experience delivering a product? And then how do you value or how does the market value a token that's tradable that doesn't have a product and then you get all this craziness? And so I think, you know, we're going to start to see those types of projects get less momentum and have a harder time raising funds. And so, you know, as individual investors too, you know, it's good to look for that and try to invest in projects that maybe already have an alpha or they're close to having an alpha or they have a seasoned team. But, you know, it's, but I think it's an interesting evolution on, on the VC model where, you know, now you don't have to wait three years or 10 years for your liquidity event. Yeah, you might, you can, you can get out in and out um, quicker. Do, do you guys actually invest in tokens or still just in equity in your, in your funds? <laughs> Yeah, uh, we, we just mainly invest in equity. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll look at some ICOs and consider it, but um, I think for most sort of early stage seed Series A investors, I mean, even though there's, you'll see these posts and hype, oh, it's, you know, ICOs are going to disrupt venture capital, um, we're not really concerned at all. You know, we think it's more complementary at the B and C stage. Uh, a, a great example is Y Combinator. You look at it, you know, they invest 120,000 $120, into these startups, ask, get six, seven percent. And a lot of these companies, they've already raised like one to five million. So the best entrepreneurs will still raise money at the seed and early stage from smart investors that could add value. And then, you know, maybe at the B or C round, uh, they'll go the ICO route, which the window is lessening, but, you know, at least I personally believe the ICO uh, channel for fundraising is here to stay. I just don't think it'll be at this typical seed stage where some companies could raise five to 10 million on average on a white paper. I think it's gonna shift to sort of mid-stage investment. Um, yeah, I think um, it remains to be seen how successful these ICO projects are ultimately gonna be. Um, as we all know, uh, a lot of these ICOs have popped, um, you know, to crazy amounts. In fact, you know, there was some conversation, I believe it was uh, late last year, 
where when some of these tokens were appreciating 10, 20, 50x uh, in a matter of a month or two, right? And if you think about venture, how venture capital works, it takes you know, typically at least five to seven years for an exit event to happen. And if you actually get a 10x, that's considered a really good outcome. So yes, there was conversation around that. But again, you have to remember, it's not the multiple that you hold while you're still gambling in the casino that counts. It's the amount that we, when you actually leave the casino, that really matters. And so while a lot of these tokens have appreciated, we all know in the past three months, they've crashed down to earth again. So if you really think about it from a longer term perspective, Again, the best way, in our opinion, to consider an ICO event is a financing event. And if you think about the options to an entrepreneur, it could be debt financing, which was the original traditional way to build companies. You'd get a loan from friends, family, or if you're lucky, get it from a bank, mortgage your house, start a company and build it, and then venture capital emerged from that. And then in the past decade, there's been the evolution further where you have crowdfunding availability through AngelList and other seed funds. You have crowdfunding ability through Kickstarter or Indiegogo for certain projects. And now you have ICOs as another means of crowdfunding. And all of these options, I think, are healthy for the entrepreneur to consider. Again, there's pros and cons. But at the end of the day, the financing event is not the goal. It's just the beginning. And ultimately, you have to create value and deliver on that value to get to the outcome that we're looking for. And so while many people are worried, and it's been brought up, ICOs versus venture capital, venture capital traditionally, at least we make an effort to add value in company building to get to that outcome that you need. And so I wouldn't say it's any adversarial uh, zero-sum game. Whatever the initial funding comes from, if the company needs to continue to grow and expand, then venture capital will still have a role to play. And we are seeing projects, I mean, I think everybody knows that uh, Y Combinator Demo Day is happening. There are a number of projects in that Demo Day that had raised successful ICOs to the, to the tone of 20, 30 million dollars that are actually raising equity seed rounds to get value-added investors that can help them hire the right people, get to the right customers, and build their business so they can, can actually realize the original vision that they set out themselves for. So again, I think it's very complementary in many ways. I mean, assuming what I said is, is correct, is that uh, the ICO market will sort of shift to the mid-stage. I think actually that's better for the regular sort of retail individual investors. Because when you invest in at the series sort of B or C, a lot of risk is taken out, but you still get great returns, right? If you think about it, a lot of risk is out. And, you know, Look at the Dropboxes, Twitters, or you know Square. I mean, Dropbox will go public soon. I think you guys, you know, if you invested at the B round, you're you're sitting pretty right now. Um, and a practical thing, if you, I would look at um, when you look at an ICO, I would look at certain numbers in terms of also what the founders uh, retain for themselves versus the company. Because I just recently came across and heard about a company that raised 30 million last year on the ICO, they just burned through everything already and they shut down. <laughs> but one signal was, and, and it, if I looked at it, like uh, I remember the founders allocated, I forgot, something like 15, 20% to themselves, right? So they're definitely looking out for themselves versus the company. So those are numbers that I would look and ask for. I mean, it has to be much smaller than that, or all to the company. I mean, that, it just, those are just signals that you could look out for. Was that in the white paper, the, <laughs> the allocation? Yeah. Of course it's not in the white yeah, paper, so see. you have to push it out. I mean, as an investor, <laughs> they tell us, but then the individuals, they don't. So that's something to really ask in the Telegram forums or whatever. <laughs> right, right, you got it. I, I think Dig for the that. other phenomenon that I think um, most of us are aware of, you know, there clearly is now a spectrum of quality in terms of ICOs today. There was a time that the rising tide raised all ICOs, and any ICO was popping, right? Those times are gone now, and I, I really don't think they're going to come back, in my opinion. And if you look at the ICOs that are out there today, I frankly believe many of them, a lot of the individual investors that are in this room may not have even heard of, 
because they're actually not going to do open crowd sales. They're actually going to private sales for their pre-sale. They're talking to investors with a lot of experience that can help them. And the phenomenon is a lot of venture capital firms, I can tell you for sure, are looking to talk to their limited partners and investors to have the ability to participate in token sales as well, if it makes sense. And I would say, you know, out of seven or eight firms out of every 10 firms on up and down in Sand Hill and Silicon Valley, everybody now has that clause in their limited partnership agreement to be able to do those token sales. And I think everybody's read the announcements that Telegram, you had some big name firms, including Benchmark and Sequoia and others participate. So the quality ICOs are actually going to the same quality investors. And the opportunity for an individual investor to actually get participation in an ICO is going to be a quality ICO is going to be limited. So the question that you have to ask yourself if you're an individual investor that doesn't necessarily have a lot of investment experience or a value add angle, you have to ask yourself, why is this ICO coming to me? Why am I having this opportunity to invest? And maybe you should scrutinize more of whether or not this is actually going to be a good investment opportunity or not. Right, that, that's some really great advice. Um, I, I like the point you made, um, Jay, about uh, the Y Combinator companies uh, going for um, both an ICO to get funding and then going back for, for equity for advisors. And I don't know, I'd like to use that maybe just to talk a little bit about the subject of tokens. And so you know, that the, what is a token? Um, well, a token, you know, besides being a security or utility, you know, it, it, it could be used for in different ways. I could say one way of looking at it might be, you know, the tokens is incentivizing the community. You know, you're trying to get people as like, almost like a co, in some cases it's like a co-op ownership where they either, you know, they, they own a share of the company or they, they're excited about your company, they, they become your fans. But yeah, those aren't the same people necessarily who are gonna, you know, advise your business deals. So this idea of, you know, getting, you know, advice from equity advisors on the business side, but also, you know, designing a token and, and distributing it among people who are going to be using your platform or advocating for your platform, that seems like a, a winning combination. Um. I mean, absolutely. And so there are platforms that, because in the nature of the business they're trying to build, is naturally distributed. I think a good example of that is uh, a project called Referium. Uh, and for those that are familiar with for, uh, Referium, I think they'll understand. But if you think about the way that, let's say, digital content, or specifically games, uh, become successful, there is a tremendous amount of viral effect that happens to happen uh, on top of the marketing spend that you have. And the marketing channels, as we know, for any indie developer in this day and age, and this is timely because we're in GDC week this week, is exorbitantly expensive the acquisition cost for an install is anywhere from three to five dollars if you're really good at it. And if not, it's very, very expensive. The phenomenon, on the other hand, for influencer marketing, where you have YouTube stars and influencers basically promote certain apps, services, and games, even those have become really expensive to do. But at the same time, the success of any single application or game is dependent on the grassroots word of mouth. And those folks get no credit and no benefit. So the way that the referring token is designed is to actually give those folks an opportunity to participate and get an incentive and some payoff in terms of the tokens that hopefully will appreciate with more usage. So the more tokens that are distributed out there, the better for them. And so they purposely will have a public sale to enable that. But even for them, quite frankly, the pri private sale was so successful that the portion that's going into the public sale is still very limited. So again, it depends on the opportunity, but the quality projects are going to private sale only, and the public sale portions are going to be very, very limited going forward. Thanks. Um, so do you, got, I mean, do you have, uh, Jay and, and Bernard here, do you guys have any personal preference on, you know, what, are, what the most, I don't know, your, your favorite types of projects to fund. You know, some people say they like to focus on infrastructure, you know, say platforms or protocols or infrastructure. You know, we're starting to see the, the first batch of distributed applications, although, you know, those are still less proven. But um, do, do you, is it pretty much all over or do you guys focus on certain areas of projects? 
I mean, I can go. I, I will tell you that my token portfolio is relatively diverse, uh, both domestic, international, both infrastructure as well as application areas. Um, I think everybody in the room will agree that because it's still early days, the issues around the blockchain in terms of scalability, security are still massive and they need to be fixed. Now the good news is there's a lot of projects that are working on aspects to fix those problems. And so naturally infrastructure plays are gonna make sense. Um, the challenge is again, the ones, I don't think it's a necessarily a matter of which area is gonna be more successful than the other. There's gonna be quality projects on the infrastructure side and there's gonna be not so interesting projects or not good projects on that side. And the same in terms of the distributed app side as well. Some projects could be very successful and others will not be. Um, so for me, I'm not looking necessarily at a category and just investing in all the infrastructure projects that are out there. I'm trying to be discerning among the infrastructure projects, which has, again, the quality teams, the ability to deliver on these infrastructure promises because the theoretical holes that are out there in the infrastructure today is very widely known. But to actually fix them is very difficult, right? And so it requires a high level of experienced teams to actually focus on that problem and fix that. And so if you find that th those teams are out there and you get an opportunity to involve, I think those are interesting. And on the same side with you know, distributed apps as well, the same thing. There's gonna be quality projects, frankly, very few quality projects in my opinion, and there's going to be a lot of not so interesting ones that you want to avoid. Yeah, so our approach, it really depends on by geography. So in the US, we look at more within ecosystem plays um, for new protocols. It could be new exchanges, new sort of consumer apps, um, even new sort of financing instruments. Uh, we invest in a company called Dharma that came out of, it was like the hot crypto uh, startup out of YC last year. They're a new play on uh, venture debt. Uh, in Asia, we see a little differently. Uh, I would sort of, we see either new technology plays uh, or new sort of enterprise, enterprise plays that come, uh, come out of Asia. Example is Blocko, the company I mentioned, they're the leading enterprise company in Korea. So they already have signed up like Hyundai Motors, Samsung Card, actually a credit card company that's using it on the back end, Cree Exchange, which is a traditional uh, financial trading platform. And Cree Exchange just came out with a report last year that uh, Blocko saved them $73 million on the back end. So you see a lot of that stuff going on in Asia. There's another company in China that we're well aware of that uses blockchain uh, technology on the enterprise side. And they also, it's a large company, and they said it saved them over 300 million. So you see that type of sort of progress in Asia, but we think eventually it'll come to the US where the B of A's and Chase's and Humana's will eventually get over their pilots and there'll be sort of real strong enterprise players uh, within the US market. Uh, the consumer side, we're sort of waiting because there's, you know, okay, okay. There's, you know, scalability issues on the on the public chain, but on the private chain, you know, we haven't really seen any issues on that front. We're going to now to have time for five minutes of questions. Also, I did find out the other two speakers were unfortunately delayed on plane, so they're unable to make it today. Um, but we can now take questions. And if you have a question, raise your hand. Isabel here will bring you a mic so we can hear you. Okay, so just raise your hand. Hi. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, equity and commodities were making sense to tie into the token economy, and I just was curious which ones that you see have the most promised in uh, this kind of setup. Like, uh, not just you know what tokens are being successful, but what kind of um, connection to like certain things. I saw something that was like banana coin <laughs> that was tied to like plantains and I'm seeing more and more and more of those things tied to gold. Um, I know we had somebody from the SEC just talk about diamonds and that being kind of fraudulent, but um, I am seeing are, more. Are you asking us to make token recommendations? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking uh, what commodities make sense in uh, kind of this incredibly volatile space. What commodities make sense? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Are you talking about gold, oil, natural resource yes. commodities? Yes. 
Wow, that's a that's a tough question. I, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Oh uh, no, that's, that's okay. One that's if you well don't know, be on my pay grade, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Could you say two words about how incentives of venture capital firms change when they invest in a startup through tokens rather than through equity? Just to explain as a background, in the classic model, as you already underlined, the venture capital firm would invest in the people uh, more often than in their business plan because they believe in the people. Um, while, is it true what I heard? anecdotally that the venture capital firms today negotiate more on the exit plan for the tokens, how quickly they can sell the tokens on an exchange rather than on changes to the business plan and to the management team. No, so, so I, I think I can answer that. So uh, any experienced venture capitalist uh, knows this, where you invest in private companies, startup stages, right? And let's say the company was massively successful and the company goes public you're not selling all the equity in that, that company overnight because you're gonna destroy value by dumping shares on the exchange, in this case, NASDAQ, right? So you, you typically will do two things. One is you're continuously trying to create value for those startup companies by continuously supporting hiring, strategic decisions, customer introductions and whatnot to make sure the value of the enterprise continues to grow. And while it continues to grow because it's already a public company, you will have opportunities to skim off the top and create an exit plan where typically on a quarterly basis alongside with the management team that you will have exit windows where it's a very orderly sale. It's pre-announced to everybody so that there's no surprises to the analyst. There's no shock of founders and investors selling. And so that's managed in a, in a way that is very well-documented and very um, prevalent. Now, the, the way that a lot of venture capitalists think about ICOs is exactly the same thing. The only difference is, instead of waiting for five to seven years and the company has revenue, customers, and whatnot, they're doing it at a very early stage. But they're not investing for the short-term pop. That wouldn't make sense. It's not a good use of capital. And, their skill set and training does not, is not conducive to that. So what they're trying to do by participating in ICOs is basically to help that project to continue to grow in value. And so at some point with the liquidity, they can actually start selling some of those tokens in an orderly way so that they can generate a return on their initial investment. Great, well thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our investor panel. Thank you so much. And don't go away, we have another great panel on blockchain adoption in the enterprise, which is a huge market opportunity, narrated again by Jim Maracondo of Consensus. Thank you. If the next panelists of speakers could come up on the stage, please. No, thank you. It's a pleasure. Are you going to be around? Yeah, yeah, I'll be around. We should talk later. Thanks, guys. Um, not till lunch, so if you need a break, feel free to go. <laughs> we have a lot of programming. <laughs> And for those who did not get the Wi-Fi password, which is on the agenda, it is crypto with a C. We do have agendas outside if you missed it. Okay, so we're gonna have the panelists on the stage in just a moment. Um, you were gonna ask each of the panelists first, introduce themselves, say who they are, what they do, and then Jim has a great panel of questions, and we'll save time at the gym, Jim, at least five minutes at the end for questions. Yep, All right. got it. Thank you. Um, okay, I guess we don't need Oh, yeah, go, go ahead. You want to talk? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, second panel discussion. Um, thanks for sticking around. Uh, we've got an interesting lineup of speakers to talk about blockchain in the enterprise. Um, just a little bit of background. You know, enterprise blockchain is a little bit further behind than, you know, consumer adoption as usual. We've got a whole bunch of different technological issues, private private blockchains, consortium blockchains. Um, there's a lot of different um, factors involved. Um, so once again, I'm uh, Jim Maricondo. I work on the global business development team with Consensus. I'm gonna let everybody, um, can we, we need one more chair. <laughs> 
I'm going to give everybody in a moment a chance to do introductions. But while, while we're getting this ready, can, can I do a, a, another couple polls? Um, please uh, appreciate your participation. Um, so it, could you raise your hand if you consider yourself working for a conventional or lar you know, large yeah, yeah, so enterprise in the audience? Hanging. Not that many people. <laughs> OK, how about work for a startup? Startups, OK. Um, how about government? Um, all right. Uh, and how about like investors or entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of people. Okay, so not so many, uh, not so many perhaps doing uh, you know large enterprise blockchain in the audience. But um, has any? I mean, has anybody? Uh, well, has anybody been in, in, in an organization that has an active like a blockchain, like a large organization that has an active blockchain project now? Just, just a few. Um, and um, have you? Spent uh, is ten thousand dollars on a blockchain project inside your company. Okay, Ra no, raise your hand. Um, wait, keep your hands raised. About hundred hundred thousand. Um, how about five hundred thousand? Okay, a couple. Um, and does anybody actually work for a company that has a blockchain system in production, like not in an innovation lab? Okay, at least at least maybe one person. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean these are some of the the problems facing enterprise blockchain adoption. Um, so hopefully we'll get to some of those topics in this panel. But to start off, um, I'd like to ask the panelists to give a, a brief introduction and one burning issue regarding blockchain in the enterprise. And um, one panelist also has a disclaimer to make, so we'll do that now as well. But starting here with Ray. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Ray Valdez. I'm a colleague of Jim's. Uh, we just met actually yesterday for the first time. I'm with Consensus. And the thing about consensus is we've grown 700% over the last year. So most of the people, if, if you meet, uh, will have been there only a short time. I was at Gartner for many years prior to that. I looked at many different startup companies over 15 years. And consensus was the one that I picked because we're doing about 50 different projects, each one of which it could potentially transform the world. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Dennis O'Connell. Uh, my background is in aerospace mechanical engineering, did work, some work for NASA. Went ahead and was involved in high frequency trading for a few years and then uh, founded two successful companies uh, where I both exited out of. I now find myself uh, in New York uh, consulting for uh, BAML. Um, and I should mention disclaimer that I'm not here representing BAML. Uh, anything I say today is That's purely my own personal that. opinion, it's a, it's uh, and nothing um, should be construed uh, the otherwise. Um, I'm also currently consulting for Ascension Protocol, who is a large um, uh, player in the fintech space in blockchain in Midtown, and uh, happy to be here. Hello, my name is Armin Ebrahimi. I'm the okay. founder and CEO of Showcard. Uh, we build digital identity. Uh, we started the company in 2015, and we're one of the 2015 made us one of the early players in the uh, blockchain space. But we actually use the blockchain for applications. Uh, our product is really an enterprise product. Consumers, at the end of the day, end up using what we produce, but we don't go to consumers directly. In most cases, it's always working with some enterprise. Uh, you, you know, I know we're going to talk a lot about it, but uh, you know, just talking about enterprise, one of the things that we faced is no different than what any startup in any industry faces, which is you build your stuff, you have to go in, uh, make a case for what you have, and work through a lot of no's until you actually get those yeses and get things working. And for us, uh, one of the most important things working with enterprise was having more actual demos and uh, use cases that you could actually show versus slides that would talk about what you could potentially build. Um, thank you. Hello, my name is Bradley Hook. I am the Chief Operations Officer of Nuhance Network, and we primarily build uh, solidly based smart contract systems for micro governments and uh, special economic zones, um, and also apply that to industries as well. Hello, my name is Indu. I work for Intuit. I lead all of uh, Intuit's blockchain efforts. For those of you uh, who plan to do your taxes with TurboTax in the next 30 days or so, thank you for your business. That's one of the products we sell. Uh, in addition to that, we do booths for small businesses. So about 30% of the nation's GDP flows through our small business booths. Uh, we see blockchain as being pretty transformational to the businesses that we're in. All right, thank you. 
Uh, maybe we could start by talking about the current state of blockchain in the enterprise. Um, maybe, you know, w what do you guys think is the, the maturity of the technology and the level of business understanding currently um, within organizations? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, I'll be I'll, tomorrow. I just got to go to another meeting. But okay. yeah, we do. Um, I'll take that one first because uh, I find myself very much on the cusp of it, almost where the water meets the sand uh, every day. Um, for me, one of the big things having to fight the few religious battles oh, yeah. in New York and uh, especially in enterprise with global banks is that there's different players in blockchain who are ready to engage enterprise sooner. And some of you guys might know them as you know Hyperledger and Fabric and even R3 Corda. Um, those are far more um, appealing to the banks and to major um, investment groups, uh, investment banks, excuse me, um, than let's say adopting dApps or adopting public blockchains like Ethereum or EOS or NEO. Um, the reason for that is control. And so right now the big thing that all decision makers, whether they're in compliance, legal, architecture, tech, or line of business, is considering how many blockchains might we have to support, what can we decommission and replace, or does this just give us a competitive advantage over our other um, uh, competitors or even help enhance our relationships with our clients. And so what you're seeing is distributed ledger technology, especially R3 and Hyperledger, really taking the beachhead in enterprise for the sole reason that these enterprises like to have full control over the entire architecture. Um, but as far as the other ones go, and especially Ethereum, um, there's definitely interest in there, although there's a lot of uncomfortable conversations that might have to be had in terms of owning data or owning infrastructure or having compliance issues with that. And so what's emerging is two different, um, uh, two different maturity cycles between DLT and blockchain, which is something that I emphasize all the time. So. Yeah, so just to follow on that, it's, uh, my co uh, panelists mentioned the key word control. So I've looked over the last four years in covering blockchain. I've talked to many, many global 1,000 companies and organizations. They're all interested in blockchain. But there's a fundamental misunderstanding and misalignment. We see that 90% of enterprise blockchain projects actually don't need blockchain technology to meet the project requirements and in fact would be better off without it. You could get your project done more quickly at a lower cost with a better quality result, with better performance and efficiency, more compatibility with systems in the IT environment, more compatibility with your staff skills if you use centralized technology. And the reason is that enterprises, even though they think they're doing blockchain, they're actually doing centralized applications in decentralized clothing. So we get, I've got many calls where they say, we want an enterprise says, we want to do a blockchain project. We want to start in, you know, a peer-to-peer -peer network and so on, except we want to make sure we control it. And if that's the case, that ain't a blockchain. Um, I'd just like to add, uh, what our experience has been, and I think part of what our philosophy was, you know, you're looking at distributed ledger and, you know, we were talking about control. The whole thing is not having control, giving up that control, in fact, to owners of data in whatever form that there is. But the thing is, we're not just doing building a theoretical system. We're a startup, we're a business. We actually want to engage with enterprises to get the solutions out there. And I think that for us, the approach that's worked well, and I think that's important for any startup uh, to, to consider, is this concept of uh, crawl, walk, run. Uh, you want to have something that's disruptive. We have our own vision of what we want things to be. But you need to have something that's evolutionary in nature. You cannot. You know, like what you were saying, a, 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 a DLT that's on a private blockchain is ultimately a central database. Um, and, you know, the infrastructure is perhaps different, but it does introduce a lot of the enterprise clients to go into the distributed ledger technology to start using the advantage, other advantages that it has. And over time, what we see is that adoption happening. There are private blockchains that could actually become public. We actually have, uh, you know, certainly for our solutions, we have uh, means of being able to take those public. But you can't do the reverse. And you know, if you're talking to a bank, for example, it's nearly impossible to convince them to be on a public blockchain, even though 
you could go ahead and talk to all the security folks and talk about why that's secure and why that's actually safe doing it. But I think it comes back into crawl, walk, run. Yeah, so maybe to share a couple of different perspectives. Um, first of all, um, just to frame this a little bit, I would say the hype around uh, blockchain and sort of this whole space is probably akin to the hype around the internet in you know <laughs> mid to late 90s. But the reality is probably closer to the late 80s, early 90s. And so uh, the maturity of the tools that you have, the ability to build applications without you know needing their PhD in computer science or whatever, um, and frankly, making sure that you're able to build these things in a way that scale, I mean, it's still super early. Now, the good news is that as opposed to the internet, I think you have some of the best and the brightest people focused on solving these problems. So I'm very optimistic that we'll sort of have the next step moment in the next you know, couple of years. But sort of as I look at it and having sort of lived through 25 years of technology evolution, I don't think we have seen that yet. So that's just framing. Um, here is probably the single biggest lesson that we have learned over the last two and a half years or three years. Um, when you use the real value of blockchain and the real value of building something on top of blockchain is when you have a business or when you have a system that has significant network effects. The problem is that requires you to think about all of this not just from a technology point of view but also from a business point of view. And the reality is building network effects and building network systems is really, really hard. So when I, I, I'll give you an example. Um, so I grew up in a really, really small town in India. And uh, it was like 5,000 people. And everybody knew everybody else. And you knew which side, you know, which side of the train tracks to avoid, which side of the train tracks to stay on. When you walked home from school, you know, if somebody offered you candy, you know, who to take from and who not, right? There was an entire just trust network in that small town that was embedded into everybody's consciousness. And at some level, what we're trying to do with blockchain is to have that level of trust at internet scale, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish. But we haven't yet figured out how to go from where we are to what that end state is. And I think that's where most of the growing pains are. That's where most of the challenges are. And Figuring out the incremental steps that allow us to build that trust. And for example, I love the work that Shotard and is doing in this space. I think identity as a foundation uh, for, that to be, for that to be something that we all understand. And using that to build this trust over time is what I think will make blockchain really realize its full potential. The one thing I would want to add to that is everything in the blockchain right now is so undefined. The capabilities are undefined. And I think that we're seeing the applications of blockchain spread very far from, um, I think you'll see tokens that are specifically, uh, I think in the other room it's like Wanken token or something, all the way to you'll see Greenium that has you know carbon credit trading focus. Um, when you dig back into that, you look at the actual functionalities of smart contracts implemented on that, you see non-fungible tokens which were created with CryptoKitties, but the same non-fungible token operated differently uh, you can do identity, you can do land registry and many other things. So I think we're in a period where we're starting to define what our left and right limits are in blockchain and really start to focus and buckle down on that. Um, I'd like to add just a little additional nuance to what some of the panelists have said. There's the notion of, you know, crawl, walk, run, but actually with regard to established enterprises, it's more crawl, ro uh, walk, swim meaning there's a chasm between what enterprises are used to doing and what's made them successful in this new world of the decentralized economy. So that successful enterprises, they're successful for two reasons. One is they've invested huge amounts of money, tens of millions of dollars in an ERP system. The whole purpose is to create a centralized system of record. They've also spent many years cultivating a business ecosystem of known and trusted stable network of business partners. Neither of those two activities is relevant for a, a basically a decentralized ecosystem where there are thousands of participants who don't know each other, don't trust each other, and don't know of each other. So 
enterprises are often barking up the wrong tree. And this is the difference between, in Clay Christensen's terms, you know, sustaining innovation versus disruptive innovation. Sustaining innovation is what banks are doing now. They're trying to use blockchain to do what they're normally doing, only do it a little better, a little faster, a little cheaper. At the end of the day, that's not a game changer. What, where the innovation is really going to happen, most likely, is going to be outside the enterprise in uh, new forms of, say, peer-to-peer -peer lending or mortgages or you know, new, new decentralized ecosystems. And for enterprises to succeed, they need to think outside of their skin, that's, uh, and that's very hard to do. Oh, okay, one more comment on the end. So, so, so I just maybe uh, would qualify what you said a little bit. I, I don't think blockchains are going to be used only in the presence of participants that are untrusted, right? One of the big opportunities that we see is that there is a lot of trust in the physical world already. And unfortunately, you know, I'm reminded of this cartoon from the mid-90s that was in The New Yorker when one dog is talking to another dog on the internet and, the, and it says something like on the internet it can be a dog, and that's true, that's still true today. I think the, one of the opportunities that we are really excited about is taking that trust that's already there in the real world and importing that into the digital online world and that can lead to lots of different efficiencies. In a world where trust is given and it's mostly assumed, but you have the ability to go back and audit and verify at no cost, you can remarkably simplify what we do today in terms of business processes, and that's a huge opportunity. I really want to emphasize the last thing that my, my colleague here said, which I really love, the, the whole difference between sustainable and disruptive innovation. And I think one of the key things we need to think about is the word enterprise, right? We're not talking about nimble startups. In some cases, we're not even talking about uh, companies that can pivot pretty quickly. And if anyone has been following along since 2008, especially with you know, the mergers, some of these entities are having cultural clashes. And so I don't want to walk, anyone walk away from this panel thinking that enterprises are homogeneous in their approach. In fact, a lot of times there's cultural classes, clashes between different lines of business. And so, for example, payment uh, lines of business are much more uh, amicable to disruptive technology, whereas um, you know those in clearing or uh, equity trading uh, are far more on the sustainable innovation, where they'll look at innovation and say, this is really great, but then they'll put space in between that. And that's because some of these entities are so large now that they're fundamentally different companies underneath the same umbrella. And that makes things very difficult for decision makers and stakeholders to get behind different technologies. And at the highest levels, people are considering what is reality where we have to support several different blockchains. And you know, enterprises routinely have multiple languages, multiple operating systems, even multiple databases. And even cloud adoption has been difficult. And so that clash of sustaining versus innovation um, <clears throat> happens within these entities every day. Uh, and there are losers, and that hurts uh, everyone. So I think that's a big takeaway, is that these enterprises are even, especially with blockchain and DLT, are fighting among themselves on what is appropriate for the entities as a whole. And sometimes those conversations lead to stifle. Uh, yeah, those were some amazing points. I'd just like to make a few of my own conclusions based on what the panelists has been saying. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, although a lot of enterprise use cases get stuck on fintech, you know, let's remind ourselves, you know, there's more than just, you know, fintech is kind of the, one of the first big at blockchain use cases, but it's, you know, not necessarily the only or the best one. You know, fintech, uh, often involves a lot of closed relationships. You know, other businesses dominated by closed networks. I mean, yeah, maybe they can use a private or consortium blockchain, but as some of the panelists alluded to, that's not really the best use for a blockchain. The blockchain is, by definition, creates this open network of participants, and that's a better use case. Um, and so, um, you know, it, um, a lot of times, uh, intermediaries, right? They, you know, we, we, our world is, we're talking about trust, you know? Like, we, we haven't had trust, so we have to use a third party to, 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 do, to, to be a marketplace or match up a, a buyer and a seller of a... Those intermediaries, you know, maybe they're not gonna be the best blockchain use case either because they're no longer needed um, or their role will shrink. And so, um, it's tricky, but, you know, these closed networks maybe are not good, are, are not, a strong blockchain use case. And so, it, in my opinion, we really boil down to three categories for enterprise 
um, blockchain use. Um, it's really either increasing efficiency, that's the, um, you know, making th lowering the cost of business. Um, that often is, you know, to an existing business, clearly. Number two is really the new business models. You know, maybe we're going to be a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace or a data marketplace or, you know, um, you know, creating some new business opportunity. The third boils down to really regulatory compliance due to the immutable uh, ledger aspect of the blockchain. You know, it's pretty good for that. And so, um, you know, there's, there, that's kind of the spectrum, and I think we've touched upon many of those in, in the talks. So I don't know if there's any really quick one last comment that someone wants to make. We can do that. Otherwise, we can take maybe one question from the audience. All right. <laughs> burning, burning, okay. I think uh, one of the things to consider in any kind of an enterprise uh, solution, I've sold to enterprises for, or built products and sold to them for the past 30 years, um, you gotta have a solution and a solution that works. It's not just, you know what, we have a blockchain solution. So, you know, for us, we don't, you know, sometimes being a blockchain-based company causes a conversation to start. But we focus on our solution, and some of those goes to the points that you mentioned, uh, being able to reduce friction, making it easier for users. And at the end of the day, if you think about what the distributed ledger provides, in most cases, not all cases, but in most cases, the ability to have individuals participate with more control. So you gotta have something that users can ultimately adopt. Uh, so usability and simplicity is a big part of it. Security is a big part of it. Those are things that you normally talk about with enterprises. And you still have to go in and have a solution in place rather than just going in and saying, you know, enterprise, I'm a blockchain-based solution, uh, you know, consider me. And that will probably help speed up adoption. And that's part of what I referred to earlier, too, in terms of, uh, you know, crawl, walk, maybe swim, but still being able to go in with solutions and what your product actually provides. Jesse's going to respond first to that. Okay. Um, no, why don't you go ahead? Oh, I just have one sure. other. Okay. So a wise man said, um, for many technologies, we typically overestimate the impact in the short term and underestimate the impact in the long term. I absolutely think that's going to be true for blockchain. Um, I think the other big piece of evolution that needs to happen in the blockchain space is to an, to an extent, the blockchain space doesn't really tie itself to the rest of the sort of technology universe as well as it should. And I think that's a problem we need to solve. Yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> follow up on that. Um, I totally agree about the long-term versus short-term. Long-term, there's huge potential. That's why I registered the domain name four years ago, Programmable Economy, because I saw the vision. However, in the short-term, we're what we could be in the enterprise sector, we could be in a, a POC bubble. <laughs> um, you know, and I've been talking about this for a year and a half. Basically, I've looked at hundreds of POCs in the enterprise. 95% never leave the innovation lab. 95% never go into production. And that's, um, that's got to change. At some point this year, enterprise is going to realize, hey, we've done all this stuff. What do we have to show for it? In the poll that Jim did, there was only one system in production in the audience, and that fits the number. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot that needs to happen. And we're going to go through what I call the enterprise um, blockchain winter. Winter <laughs> is coming. However, there will be spring over the long term, and that's where I agree with my colleagues. Hi, so um, a big problem we see in enterprises is that a uh, lot of data is actually in disparate data sources. And the element of trust is actually not around the participants, but, uh, but on the quality of data itself. Uh, so data is actually liability, not an asset, a lot of enterprises today. So knowing these two big challenges at enterprises, and I'm talking outside finance, I'm talking about sectors like energy, healthcare, um, how you guys reckon you could apply blockchain to solve these two fundamental challenges, if at all? Thank you. Before we do, we're about to enter the ICO pitches. Everyone who's doing your four-minute pitch, please come and sit in the two front rows here so we can go quickly through each pitch without having to wait for you to come to the front of the room. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Zahaba, can you just rephrase the question? It's really hard to hear on the stage. Just, or just speak it really so, loudly. So I deal with enterprises, primarily energy and healthcare, right? And the biggest challenge we're seeing is that a um, lot of the data at these enterprises is A, in disparate data sources, so it's actually not even centralized. 
And B, the problem is not trust, like I think Indy was mentioning uh, around participants. The problem is that data itself can't be trusted because the enterprise themselves don't know if it's a good quality data. So knowing these two challenges, do you think there's any application of blockchain to actually you know, solve, the, solve them, if at all? We have time for one uh, response from someone. I'll, I'll take a stab. So the question was about data, and that, that's actually, there's a lot of data in the enterprise. Having it immutable adds a little value, but the problem is that data, the original data is not trusted. There are things called oracles um, that are part of the blockchain ecosystem that are um, basically aggregate feeds of data that have different kind of reputation and trust mechanisms to create trusted sources of data that will work in conjunction with decentralized applications. Great, it's let's give a round of applause. Thank you to our panelists. Uh, don't go away. We're about to start an exciting part of our day, which are the ICO pitches. We, please sit in the front of your pitching today. Um, we do have judges, right? Yeah, okay, you wanna, uh, we have some judges here. Do you want to announce who you are? Um, hello, my name is Alexey Vladimirovich Kuroshenko. Try to remember this name and sleep with this. So uh, I love to pitch, and uh, now uh, it's my first time when I will be as a judge because it's opposite side, and I know how to do it. And now uh, my pleasure to see how you will do it, guys. Yeah, and uh, who is the winner will be announced uh, to our clients. So. Yeah, and the end of the day, if we announce who is the winner, who is it, guy or girl? Thank you very much. All right, so we'll announce the winner at 5.30 before the cocktail party. Hi, guys. My name is Vince Coley. I'm actually a startup judge at Stanford, UC Berkeley, and MIT. I've been doing this for the last five years. So all the best for all the ICO pitches. Please make sure you just put your value proposition, because that will be a key highlight. Once again, all the best of, best of luck. Okay, great. So now we're going to start with our first ICO pitch, and each one gets four minutes. As you can see, we keep you on a strip time clock. We do have a clock here, so when you're pitching, you'll know when you need to end, because we will ask you to stop. We will not have time for questions, just a pitch. And then when we're done with this, this, we will have lunch in the expo hall. As I mentioned earlier, if you have a color sticker, you get lunch in the back of the expo hall. If you don't, you're welcome to come and network with our exhibitors. We just can't offer you lunch. And then we will resume here promptly at uh, 1.30, uh, I believe. All right, so who's the first pitch? Yeah, all right. So you can go and use this on the stage. Yeah, and you have a clicker to get through. Uh, uh, there should be a remote. Does someone take the remote? We don't see it. Does anyone have our remote clicker? Uh, okay. okay. I have a. I have another one. I can go get for you. That was your only one. And nobody accidentally took our remote because it's missing. <laughs> okay, they have another one. Okay, they're going to bring another one. Okay. It's not working. Ready? Okay. <clears throat> There's one thing in this room that everyone wants, and it's mass adoption and Social Wallet is looking to solve that, that issue. Let me just get to our, this is the UI of our platform. There you go. So Social Wallet has created a platform that allows any cryptocurrency that we list to be transferred over social networks. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, all email providers. And 
in the first year, we're gonna have 14 of the top 20 social networks in the world integrated. And how we do this is, again, we're going to the people that, we're going in their comfy space. We're going to Facebook. We're trying to get mass adoption. We're trying to make it happen. Uh, so if you look at our, our UI, we created it to look just like um, Venmo, PayPal, and, and those sorts. So it's a very clean and simple UI that anyone in the world will be able to understand and use. So if you click, all you have to do is click send. You can pick what platform you want to send cryptocurrency over. So Twitter, Facebook, uh, but we'll do Twitter right now just for an example. Um, you can type in any contact you want. Now, when you are on the platform, you're gonna, your contacts will upload. But if you want to reach somebody that's not even in your contact list, you now have that capability. So you can enter in their name. Uh, you put in the amount. And Wire is the utility token of the platform. Uh, the transaction fees in Wire, and it'll also be the first cryptocurrency that's universally sent over social media. Um, you put in a note, just like you would Venmo, and you click Send. So we're going to use Twitter for an example. Uh, if you're sending to me on, or if I'm sending to you on Twitter, I will enter in all that information and then I will send. Now on your end, you're gonna get a notification on Twitter that says that I have sent you cryptocurrency. So the first thing that we've done that no one else has done is create a universal mechanism to send over social media. The second thing that we've done that no one else has, has done so far is create what I call a zero knowledge recipient. So right now, if you wanna send cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin, for example, to one another, you have to have both pre-download a wallet, exchange an address, and then the transaction happens. This isn't the case anymore. What we can do is, we'll go back to the Twitter example, when you see the notification that I have sent you Bitcoin, all you have to do is click accept. And when you click accept, our platform populates, and then you put in a username and password, and now you have a Bitcoin wallet. So you don't have to pre-download anything. It all happens after the fact. So now when you take that, when you take our zero knowledge recipient and you, you give the reach of social media, now we can reach, you can reach anyone in the world and they're one click away from having their first cryptocurrency wallet. Uh, so we think that that's revolutionary and we're getting a lot of interest from, from coins right now because they wanna have that reach. Right now, we're all fighting for that 1% that is already in cryptocurrency. And we're trying to slowly drag other people in. With our platform, you can aggressively go after the entire world. Uh, so if you're, let's pick a coin, Bitcoin, let's say that they want 10,000 new wallets downloaded and new users downloaded in the next month. Well, all they have to do is find 10,000 usernames that don't have a Bitcoin account. They can send Bitcoin straight to them on their social media and when they, when they click accept, that's now 10,000 new users that were never on cryptocurrency that now have a wallet and now are more intrigued about how, how and why uh, blockchain is the future. Thank you. All right, I'm Phil Sigler, and I've been involved in real estate ever since I was 18, and I've been in a high-tech company as well. And we all have reasons for investing into various cryptocurrencies, such as these right here. I currently own 53 different ones. But there's a lot of people that are sitting on the sidelines that I call crypto skeptics, and they ask four very important questions. One, what backs it? Two, is it regulated, or in some cases, even legal, as we heard today? Three, what keeps it going? What's the utility behind it? And four, who is the team? Who is behind it? Well, it'd be amazing if there was a token out there 
that at least answered one, if not all four of these today. Wouldn't that be great? Something that had more meat to it? Well, today there is. And it is the Lending Coin, which is a blockchain empowered real estate lending platform that is backed by real estate. So the Lending Coin is a decentralized peer to peer lending platform that is offered to the world. We are doing 0.25% below prime, which who can do that? No banks can offer that today. They're always 1%, 2% above prime. But we are trying to change the industry and the way we do business. There's no hidden fees and no prepayment penalties. This is a building I have out of Boise, Idaho called the Boise Tech Mall. Our current note on this is a one million, we currently owe $1 million. It's appraised at 2.2. So very low loan to value that any bank would refinance. We are at 5%, which is $7,000 a month that we pay for our mortgage. Our total interest over the next 15 years is going to be $484,000. So it's amazing how that compound interest trick works, right? We'll be at 37% of our loan. So when we refinance with a lending coin, that will put us at $1,000 per month in savings with $100,000 of interest saved. TLC's benefit is they will reap the rewards of the $383,000 over the next 15 years. So right now we're focused on commercial buildings only, which is our phase one. And you must have experience in real estate and a low loan to value, strong credit score, and a good character, meaning we must like you. So why the Lenny coin? Well, it's backed by real estate. But is it regulated? And that's a very important question because we know it's a one-way street to more and more regulations. So what have we done? Well, we are currently uh, have our Reg D filing. That means we can accept from accredited investors only. We're in the process of filing our Reg S and then a Reg A plus. And we feel very excited about this offering as we feel like we have a great recipe to see this occur. So why the lending coin? Well, it's backed by real estate. And it's regulated and leading the way for compliant tokens. So what keeps it going? What's the utility behind it? The way this works is people buy TLC tokens. We refinance buildings at that 0.25% below prime. The borrower will pay their fixed monthly payment. And the mortgage payment is converted into TLC. From there, once we refinance $50 million worth, that's $300,000 a month worth of TLC tokens being purchased. And what do we do with that? We continue to refinance more and more buildings. So we always have a buyer. And it's peer-to-peer -peer lending in its finance. It's no difference than if all of us in this room got together and we loaned to each other. So why are we using a blockchain? Well, it's transparent. It's more secure. And you could read the rest. So, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Very much. All right, thank you. And as with all of our speakers, they are going to have booths, and we encourage you to talk to them during lunch and the cocktail party. And next we have Cranium. Cranium. Thank you. He left the remote there. Hi. So imagine a world where you were incentivized to produce and consume green energy, where utilities could be incentivized to offer the market a real peer-to-peer -peer energy trading market, and energy transactions could be really monetized in the value according to the demand and supply of such energy. So I'm proud to introduce here Greenium, and my name is Asaf. In Greenium, uh, we create a decentralized platform which is global and rewards green energy producers to move to green and allow different set of applications for the actors in the energy market. It's based on fundamentals of um, very efficient data mining procedures, which is uh, as a global outreach on a human level. And no matter if you're in Africa or if you're in India, you'll be incentivized to integrate uh, your data and um, and installations to the Greenium network and have a set of benefits. 
the validation procedure is very important when you try to deal with real assets. One of the main things you need to ask yourself, is there a decentralized validation mechanism you can count on? And uh, we in Greenium have been developing that technology in the last few years, been tested and patented in a few sites around the world, and proven to be the most efficient in validating energy transactions and determining if it's coming from wind, if it's coming from solar, and what is the time and, and uh, place this, this transaction happened. And Greenum API is a way where the actors in the energy market and also each one of you can integrate and get a different set of benefits by supporting um, more green energy solutions. About our token, our token is the ERC20 token called Green. It's a utility token. We uh, use this token as a reward mechanism, first of all, for the actors, for the installers and the green generators, but also for the consumer market that wants to help the grid be balanced according to demand and supply. Um, and the data which is um, generated from all the network is used to optimize the network and to cut the losses we have today and mainly to allow um, a grid which is based on 100% renewables, which is a very big challenge for our planet. About our ICO, um, we're going to be having the, the 22 of April, which is also a very symbolic date, the Earth Day, our pre-ICO, and then having um, a campaign of pre-ICO for one month, and the ICO itself aimed for the end, beginning of June till July because we want to approach as much as possible, of course, communities around the world and uh, people that, and companies that support um, green energy and the use of the blockchain for really the challenges that we have today on our planet. Energy is, of course, the main of them. As for the green token allocation, it's all transparent. We treat it as a public company. Um, we have uh, some certain amount which is uh, of token, which is one billion token, but the supply um, is limited and released to the market in a very, um, by phases that you can uh, go over. And the um, con use of contributions are mainly to continue the development and on all the needs of the platform and services behind it. Long-term roadmap, um, today we are running a few pilots with our partners um, in the US, in India, and Europe. And we're going to be um, declaring more partnerships in the coming weeks and months. We have a great progress. And if I'm uh, presenting shortly our partners, you can go over it and stop. All right. All um, right. Thank you very much. Like the Academy Awards. Thank you. Um, and next we have Intiva. And while they get up there, I just want to mention that our hashtag, if you didn't see it in your agenda, is CBCONF, C-O-N-F, C-B-C-O-N-F. So please tweet, Instagram, do all those fun social media things about our event today. And now we're going to have Intiva. Thank you. So introducing the first tokenized medical ecosystem focused on doctors and licensed medical professionals, Intiva Health. I'm John Hartigan, the EVP of Strategic Development and Partnerships. Intiva rewards doctors and licensed medical professionals with tokens for taking actions in the platform, of which we have 24. They can then use those tokens to purchase curated medical goods and services within our platform to assist them in their career journeys. Things like continuing medical education, medical malpractice insurance, and a number of others. The current state of affairs, physicians spend almost nine hours a week in non-clinical, non-patient paperwork. That translates in aggregate in the United States healthcare system to $53 billion lost in the noise just on the physician side. And that does not include the many, many more billions on the facility and medical group side due to the inefficiencies of the current credential management platforms. We put this time and this money back into play for better patient care. In Tiva, how do we do this? In Tiva is the first 
integrative career and credential management platform for healthcare professionals built on Hashgraph. Today, thousands of users are in our platform looking for jobs, taking CME courses in our uh, online library, um, doing uh, credential management with facilities all around the country, as well as uh, taking advantage of our HIPAA-compliant digital messaging suite, allowing for coordinated care uh, and ordering labs and a number of other things in order to, that, that are integrated within over 700 EHRs and EMRs. The Hashgraph distributed ledger technology, if you haven't heard about it yet, 50,000 times faster than blockchain. You can read the proofs. This allows us to achieve secure, instantaneous credential verification, a process currently taking months in some cases, in most cases actually, to now seconds. Intiva sets the new standard for healthcare identity, verification, and reputation. I look forward to answering any one of your questions regarding our token private sales starting on April 19th. One of the interesting things about our token sale is for U.S. accredited investors, we are offering a, an equity stake in Intiva Token Inc. and the tokens will be issued as a shareholder benefit. This model from our friend in the SEC is staying in, in touch with the latest SEC guidelines and we believe that 50% of our raise will come from the U.S. Again, join our Telegram uh, Intiva Token chat channel to find out more. Come by the booth, would love to talk to you. I appreciate your time. And I'll do a little song and dance if you want. Hello, everyone. Uh, we are Johnny and Marcus from the XY Oracle Network, or XYO Network. We just heard uh, at the panel event, we heard something about Oracle's uh, immutable data sources, uh, which provide data for smart contracts. And that's exactly what we do. We are the world's first decentralized location Oracle, meaning we provide uh, location data for smart contracts, and they make uh, location transactable. Um, we are around since 2012. We are an IoT company. We bootstrap with millions of dollars of our own money, venture debt. We are SEC qualified and regulated as a Reg A plus since 2016. <laughs> we have a Reg D and Reg S. Um, so we are also one of the compliant ones. I think uh, everybody has to be today. Uh, and um, we actually have a talk at 2 p.m. So we're going to keep it short and not win the competition. Uh, because I need to talk from 2 till 2.30 and still keep it interesting. <laughs> so with that, I hand off to Johnny, who heads our community. OK, I'm still going to try to win the competition. Uh, so Marcus mentioned that we are uh, an IoT company in part. Uh, the devices that we make are Bluetooth devices, GPS trackers that serve as sentinels, uh, heuristic uh, they record heuristic data, and they also record on their ledgers their interaction with other devices. What that means is that you can examine the uh, ledgers of two separate devices uh, and independently confirm that they were at the same place at the same point in time. This means that it's almost impossible to spoof and that uh, it is decentralized. It's not dependent on GPS technology or any other specific centralized uh, uh, process to, uh, to provide that data. 
Uh, so Marcus, like I said, is going to be speaking at uh, 2 o'clock, so I don't want to steal his thunder too much. Uh, we are in a uh, token sale right now. Uh, it began on Tuesday. You can uh, hear Marcus talk about it at 2 o'clock, or you can join our Telegram channel at t.me slash xyo network. Thank you very much. Anything else you want to add, Marcus? No. All right. Where's the uh, clicker? Oh, okay, okay. Right, so I'm Vlad Lobok, the founder and CEO of Bonfield Platform. And Bond is a next generation video streaming service for premium content from independent creators. Now, we all love to watch videos online and we pay for premium content. But for some reason, we don't see enough good content, good films, good TV shows. And the reason is because all existing online services offer little or no monetization to the creators of online content. Uh, platforms like Amazon, like Netflix, also decide which content is going to be produced next because they invested in it, right? But that's not the only way the media industry can function. And I will tell you how Bond will change the rules of this game. So our economy is based on three basic principles. The first one is fair and decentralized revenue distribution. And Bond has a unique token economy with revenue distribution based on subscription payments. Two, financing new content through crowd investing. And three, storing content ownership on the blockchain. Now, to access premium, platform, premium content on our, on our distribution platform, users will need to pay a fixed monthly subscription fee, like they do today on Netflix and Amazon. But instead of keeping those revenues to the platform, our algorithm will distribute them uh, directly to the owners of the content. How? Very simply. Uh, every time the user watches a film or a video, our algorithm will send some part of their monthly payment to the owners of that video. Now, this means that our platform, there are no free views. If a video is being watched, it is automatically being paid for. Viewers can support their favorite creators by simply watching their content. Now, the second idea, the crowd investing, is it allows creators to pitch the new projects to the audience, to the crowd, describing what they want to produce, how they plan to do it, and how much money they need, like they do today on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, right? But instead of perks and pledges like a t-shirt or a mug, investors will receive the percentage of content ownership. Now, this means that those who fund new projects will actually receive a percentage of future revenues. There is no middleman who will decide which content gets produced and which does not. It is decided by the audience. There is no middleman to decide who receives the revenues and who does not. The revenues are distributed automatically by our algorithm. Now, so to recap, Bonfield Platform is a financial model which provides a solution for monetization of a long tail of video content. Bond is a video streaming platform, and Bond is a crowd investing platform. Now, Bond's economy benefits all participants. Creators monetize their works by uh, uploading them to the, to the platform and receiving views from, from users, and they also get funding for new content. Audiences watch new content which they selected and they funded. And anyone can become an investor and receive revenues from successful projects. Now, I know this may take time to change the way this huge industry works, the huge film industry works, but I also know that this is the way that it should function, right? And if you can help us make this vision a reality, if you want to join our community, I invite you to do so, and let's change the future of film and video industry together. Thank you. I know it was short. I know we don't have a lot of time for the questions, but if I have like one minute, I can give you a very quick cal calculation for like with our algorithm, how much a video with 10,000 views can make on our platform. Like with, with average statistics that every user watches uh, on average at least 50, like no more than 50 different creators, different video videos from different creators every month. And with a subscription payment, the basic subscription payment of $7, the video of 10,000 views can make at least $1,000 on our platform. This is something that does not exist in the world today. Thank you.
Next, we have Fan Token, and we're doing right on schedule. I keep it strict so you guys can have lunch. Like everybody, we've got uh, clicker problems here. Hold on one second. Wicked fun. <laughs> no, understood. But uh, there we go. All right, just making sure it works. Right on. <clears throat> Guys, hello, I'm Patrick Dees. I'm the co founder and chief gaming officer at Fan Controlled Football and Fan Token. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the future of sports and why we believe it's interactive. And right now, we are on a mission to modernize the fan experience. We've all, we've all been there, we've all been at home, we've been watching football or any sport, right, and been really upset at this lean back experience. We're just watching uh, our favorite sport, being really upset at the teams making decisions without any input from us, right? So we've all seen this, this is the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, right? Remember, uh, Seahawks are- You don't throw a pass when you have Marshawn Lynch. We all remember this, football fans in here? You do not Sports throw fans? a pass at the goal line when you have Marshawn Lynch. All the time, one of my favorite video games. It's phenomenal. That is the modern That's spirit. the game? It's never not funny to me, uh, right? So we're, we're out to modernize that experience, right? Like, again, it's a lean back experience. Marshawn Lynch, right at the goal line. Uh, we all knew that they should have just punched that in. And we're here to, we're here to talk about that. Um, we actually did it. So last year, we, in 2017, we purchased an, uh, an indoor football team in the, in the IFL, right? America's premier like, indoor football league. And we made it fan run from the start, from the ground up. Fans chose our logo, our mascot, uh, our cheerleaders, our head coach, the players that made the team, and then they called plays in real time for the entire season. And how did it go? It worked incredibly well. Our team finished third in the league in total offense. We had the offensive player of the year. You can see a little bit of the quotes here. We had a, a text from a man in Australia. We had fans calling plays in 100 different countries uh, across the world. Uh, we called about 19,000 plays per game. Um, and you, you, can see, you can see the UI on the screen a little bit and also uh, some, some tweets saying, hey, like, you, can't you can't help but feel great. Uh, when, when your play pops up. The world took notice. You can see USA, Forbes, Slate, GeekWire, Sports Techie, Sports Illustrated, all were intrigued with what we were doing. We are literally changing sports and putting the power in the hands of the fans. So you fast forward to that. So that was our proof of concept team. This, in early 2019, we were launching the FCFL. That is the Fan Controlled Football League. This is the first pro sports league built entirely on the blockchain and designed from the digital fan. We're rethinking how football should be from the ground up, and it's powered by some heavy hitters, right? So we've signed partnerships with IMG, CAA, and signed an exclusive two-year agreement with Twitch where they've taken an equity position in the FCFL, and we're deeply integrating to maximize that, that fan engagement experience with Twitch. We're very incredibly excited about it. We get asked a lot, so why the blockchain? Sure, two very quick things. One, uh, transparency. We're very literally putting the uh, the lives of our players in the hands of our fans, and they need to know within a surety on that ledger that the decisions that were made um, were the ones that were made and those were the calls that were called. Additionally, we can tokenize it. Last year with that, that fan run team, we had a, um, an, an economy called Fan IQ. And essentially that means that we believe everybody gets a vote, but not every vote is created equal, right? So the, the, more time, the more time you spend in the ecosystem calling plays, interacting, voting on things, the more weight your vote will carry. Same with tokens. You can actually buy the fan token, the fan access network token, uh, and your vote will ca carry a lot more weight. But you can also go earning them. This is a free-to-play experience. Anybody can join in. Anybody can call plays. Anybody can participate in this league. Uh, we've got an allocation of tokens that you can go earning as you engage in the ecosystem. So again, we are the, the, the fan token. It's the fan access network token. And we believe this is going to power all sports. We genuinely believe uh, ING wants us to power cricket, the whole nine. Uh, World-class, uh, obviously, investors and, um, and advisors, Stephen Arioff, the co-creator of Ethereum, all of the blockchain IL guys. We raised $5.2 million. We were Indiegogo's first token sale. Um, so th that was our pre-sale. Uh, we're the first one to do it. Our, our, our public sale will, will happen probably in late May, late March. And this is the fan experience that we're trying to create as they play me off. Hey, guys, we've got another one of our offensive coordinators up here. This is Ben. This is Noel. This is from our, uh, from our team last year. I'm going to pass. We still got 11 yards to go. I don't want to see him kick yet. I want to see him pass it in. Kind of a rough start out there, but it seems to be coming back now. What do you think? Yeah, I'm actually pretty encouraged. Uh, you know, fans are doing pretty well to get a couple of good drives in there. We're, we're getting better. All right, Ben and Noel, thanks very much. Enjoying the game in 117. Let's see this fourth down. Screaming Eagles going for it here. 
Verlon Reed drops back, lots of pressure, looking deep into the end zone. Yes, Touchdown! Oh. All right. What a great fan Lauderdale. play ball. All right. What a great fan Thank you. play ball. All right. Thank you very much. All right, next we have Scott Adams, who is the Dilbert creator and the WenHub co-founder. And then we have three more after that, and then it'll be lunch. Thank you. Thank you. So how many of you uh, have ever seen a Dilbert comic strip? Raise your hand. All right. Um, don't hold that against me. That's not why I'm here today. Uh, I'm here as co-founder of WenHub. Uh, our app went live this week, so it's up and running. We've got thousands of users already on it. I'll tell you about that. And I'll also tell you about why we have the blockchain integrated with it. Uh, our ICO is public already, so both the app is real and the ICO is public right now. Uh, best way to describe the app, let's see, you got a lot of buttons on here. Uh, we like to describe it as sort of like the Tinder app, except to find an expert who's available for a video call right now. So one of our differentiators is the right now part. It's people who can talk to you right now on any topic. Our definition of expert is not just boring business experts about marketing and blah, 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 but we include those. Our experts could be, for example, suppose you were a parent of a special needs kid. There's somebody who might be entering that situation who would like to get the advice, find out what they have in front of them. There might be somebody who needs a tutor for their kid. They can't handle this topic, but there's somebody on our app who can. Um, they might, um, some other examples would be, uh, let's say you were a medical marijuana user and you wanted to grow some cannabis at home. Uh, you wanted some advice on that, 15 minutes could save you a lot of time. Let's say you were a dog trainer. All right, so any kind of expertise, anything you've done that someone else hasn't done, you can self-rate yourself as an expert. You can set your own uh, minimum time. It could be just 15 minutes. You set your own rate, and you set the topics on which you are an expert at. Uh, consumers will get choices of experts that are online right now. They can swipe through them, pick the ones they want. Um, and they'll be able to rate each other after the calls. Now, why do we use the blockchain? You're probably wondering. And um, the benefits of the blockchain in our case is that, uh, first of all, it does all the back office stuff, the billing, the invoices, the escrow, uh, and that paperwork part. But we also eliminate the, the banking hassle. So by eliminating the bank, we don't have the paperwork, we don't have the restrictions, we don't have the censorship that might be an issue and we don't have the cost of the bank. But in addition, because we have tokens that work within the, uh, within the product, these tokens can be used to incent the first users, so they get some tokens they can use to call an expert right away. And then they get a taste of it right off the bat. Uh, and also we can use those tokens for uh, refunds in case there's any customer service problems. Uh, and people all over the world can get into this. Uh, they can have a part of a operating business. They could share it in the upside if there is any, but it's not an investment, of course, in the normal sense. Why would you want to uh, have an ICO, uh, have this ICO? Well, I would say that if you're in the ICO space, you probably want to diversify because it's largely speculative. There's a lot of guessing. And one thing you might want to have in your portfolio is a company that's got a stable team. We've been working together for a couple of years. It's our third major project. And we have a, a product that's up, it's running, it has customers, it's in both the app stores. And uh, you could quite easily kick the tires and take a look. Uh, several people in this room have the app already loaded. And some of them have told me, came up to me, they just recognized me and said they're using it already. So it's big, it's real, it's uh, something you can invest in. And if you want to diversify your portfolio, this is probably a good, good thing to look at. And that's my time. Thank you. So I'll just leave up the uh, address so you can find that. Thank you. So Arnie Abraham is not here? No, I'm up here. I'm up here. 
Well, thank you. Um, I think I was on the panel earlier, and I just want to tell you guys about our uh, product and our company and what we're doing. What we're building at Showcard is a mobile digital identity where the users are in control of the data, but the data is validated on the blockchain. Um, if I, um, there we go. The concept behind what we have, and I'm going to rush through these. We do have a booth. Uh, you're welcome to come for more information. But the concept is that users have the data on the mobile device itself. There's four basic things that need to go in there. One is access control through a pin, as well as touch ID, face ID, or whatever the device requires. We also capture biometrics. And biometrics is because we don't want to identify people just by device, by device, along with who the person behind that device itself is. The other component of that is an ID. The ID depends on the use case. Uh, it could be a driver license or a passport, oftentimes for uh, uh, financial transactions or travel. It could be an uh, employer ID or any other form of identification by some authority who, who ultimately says who you are. Now, what we do today is we grab that data and we do present that to different uh, points of authority. It could be governments, it could be banks, it could be airports, airlines. We do that because we have to be identified. By today, we get identified over and over again. And it's very costly, it, co it causes friction. You as individuals will pay more costs as you wait in line, but the enterprises actually have to pay money for agents to verify you. The concept is if we could create a certification on each one of those KYCs or each one of those identifications that happen, and attach that to your identity, then we can have a full ID. And one that you could travel and digitally identify yourself. The reason that we use the blockchain in the process is you have a user that grabs their biometrics and their ID, they load that up in their mobile device, the data stays on the device itself, but we put digital signatures of one-way hashes of the data on the blockchain, and we call that a self-certification. Very simply, when you actually present that, let's say, to a bank, you can present your data to the bank, and you can prove the ownership of that self-certification through a challenge response, because you own that private key that was basically used to sign that. When you do that, then the bank goes through a process of authenticating you for the first time, let's say through a KYC process, they can add their own certification on the blockchain, pointing back to your record that's signed with their private key, and now you have a complete identity with your data on your mobile device, two one-way signatures of hashes of data that you could go back and prove that you own that particular digital record and someone of authority has authenticated you. You could take that data to another bank, present it, and at transaction speed be identified. You could take that to any other party. It could be a credit reporting company, it could be a merchant, anyone else who needs to identify you, they don't have to go through the process again. This is a very simplified version of this, and there are other cases of this thing that can actually uh, that get more involved. We've been around for three years. We started the company in 2015. We actually have patents on our technology, um, one that, uh, and both of them dating back to 2015, one that we received last year and one earlier this year. We have three additional patents and 17 more provisionals, lots of technology behind what it is that we've actually created. We have a number of customers, many of which we're not still at, at, at liberty to discuss who they are, but various customers that have done anything from POCs to pilots to actual production using our product. What we're doing is we're planning an ICO in May, of, uh, May 28th of this year. Um, we're offering that through a SAF. Uh, we've done a Reg, a, a Reg D uh, filing on that. The goal is to raise $20 million with $10 million that in pre-sales. Uh, you can see some of the details of the uh, token sale itself. Um, but some of the things that's different about Showcard and Showcoin and what we're offering is that the product has actually been in the market. This is not investing in something that we're going to just build in the future. We have real customers, and the funds that we actually raise, a lot of that is going to go to expanding the market and the go-to-market strategy itself. We're following the SEC rules to protect investors and the company. We're big believers in investors. We're actually a VC-backed company, and we have existing investors. And we spend a lot of time working through details to make sure what we're doing would be compliant. And that's important if you're investing in anything. OK. All right. Well, with that, if you have any questions, come on, Booth. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I need to see who's next. Okay, and next we have IT Biometrics.
Hi, I'm Howard Prager, founder of IT Biometrics. Okay, we address a huge problem common to all cryptocurrencies and wallets. Uh, as you see, many types of wallets hold cryptocurrencies and uh, problems, cloud hot wallets can be hacked. Hard, hardware and cold wallets require complex password management. Uh, to date, Bitcoin losses total $15 billion from hacking. Crypto Secure uh, now has a patent pending solution. Uh, we have the key to secure digital transactions and you are the key with your fingers. A crypto uh, biosecure is a personal biometric fingerprint wallet. It uses your fingerprint to access your wallet, but it also verifies that you are a live person. Uh, other fingerprint readers can be fooled by a picture of your fingerprint. Uh, with crypto biosecure, an image or copy of your fingerprint will not work. Um, we use multi-factor biometric authentication to access your wallet. Fingers from either hand can be used in a special sequence to provide validation. The most secure of all wallets without needing passwords or phrases. Uh, if lost or destroyed, the restoration seed is your fingerprint. No password is needed. Uh, multi, uh, multiple uses beyond the cryptocurrency. And I want to mention with respect to the multiple uses that, uh, you know, there's so many uses. How many people are software developers here? Anybody that is software developers? Raise your hands high, please. Okay, I want you to know you can buy, if, you're, if you are a software developer or you're not, you can... You can buy this product now. It's ready to ship, except I want to delay the shipment because we're working on firmware and, and we already have an SDK. And there's hundreds, hundreds of apps that can be developed off of it, okay? We're a hardware company. We'll work with you in order to, uh, in fact, we can suggest many apps that are mercantable, that, that are monetizable. And, uh, and you can develop them. If you own one of these, you get automatically, you get the future of, uh, of all of the future apps. Uh, and, uh, and you have these and future case, um, uh, use cases and so forth. And there are dozens and dozens. Uh, uh, we, we, hand, we can handshake with all the, all the MasterCards, Visa, et cetera. With all the, all the exchanges, we can eliminate hacking. Eliminate hacking. Uh, identity, you can prevent identity theft. Literally prevent identity theft by putting on the blockchain, putting your specific uh, um, IT biometric uh, signature. And once your signature is on the, on the block, on the uh, cha uh, blockchain, then that is your identity. Therefore, no one else can, you know, create your identity. There's just hundreds. I would like you to meet with me. I don't know if my four minutes is up or not, but it says uh, 30 seconds left. Any questions? Anybody? What's the price? In fact, we're going to put this up for Dutch. So come over and make us an offer. Right now, we don't have a price. I, literally, make us an offer. And, uh, and we're going to uh, sell it. Obviously, it's going to, we're going to sell it at above our cost, but we want to get these out, to, especially to developers. Developers, we want you. Right. One second. Okay. Great. Thank you. And this is our last presentation from Pitch Live. And they're pitching for 10 minutes, Isabel. So, 10 minutes. And then right after this, I'll tell you the directions for lunch. Here, here's the Hello. Mic. Where's the, um, the queue? Not sure. Hey, guys. I'm Matt Lally. This is Jonathan Foltz. What's going on, guys? We're the co-founders and along with 40 other people around the world who are dedicated to this project. We're Pitch Investors Live. What's up? <laughs> So, uh, look, Jonathan and I have uh, separately founded many, many companies prior to this one. And we're both located outside of the main hubs of New York City and San Francisco. 
And so we can attest to how difficult it can be for an entrepreneur to gain early stage capital outside of this area. Uh, well, I mean, that was the case until fairly recently when along came token sales. And now people are raising huge amounts of money from all over the world with a good project and a good team. But there's a big problem with token sales, which is that if you're new to the crypto space, it can be very, very difficult to figure out what is a good project and what is a bad project. You know, people just end up buying tokens that everyone else is buying, and that's pretty bad. So um, what we think needs to happen is the crypto space in general, but also token sales specifically, need to become really more digestible to people who are fairly new to the, to the space. Yep. yep, so there's also three major components that blockchain and crypto is missing today. Uh, number one is entertainment. A lot of you guys saw crypto kitties. Okay, so it took the industry by storm when something that was actually entertaining and fun came to the world. So much so that it actually clogged up the Ethereum network. That was something that we hadn't seen before. So number two is information. As Matt was saying, it's becoming harder and harder to discern a good project from a bad. You have to take a look at a crazy amount of white papers, you have to listen to your friends, you have to check out you know, uh, hundreds of pages through Google to figure out what's a good project from the bad. It's getting really hard. And then number three is education. So as fast as crypto is moving right now, there's becoming a bigger and bigger gap between like, the true education levels and what's actually happening. So we're actually here to solve these problems. So we looked at lots of different sources for inspiration. How can we solve this problem? And our favorite source of inspiration was TV's Shark Tank and Dragon's Den, West Texas Investors Club. We love these shows. And uh, basically, if anyone's never seen it, then the format is an entrepreneur comes on, he speaks to either one or a panel of investors, and he tries to impress them by talking about his project. They try to grill him. The audience at home gets to watch this, sometimes roasting, and they get to really understand what business is about. The audience reports that they really learn to understand how business works and how to spot a good project. Yep. So we want to introduce to you guys Pitch Investors Live. We're the only app that allows startups and entrepreneurs to pitch investors live. So we're going to go ahead and show you guys a quick clip so you can get a quick synopsis of what it is that we do. Hey, what are you doing there? Stop. You've seen these ads before. We're not doing that. In a world of... Nope, we're not doing that either. How about this? Imagine a world where entrepreneurs and startups have the opportunity to pitch potential investors from absolutely anywhere in the world using the blockchain platform all within an app. Think Shark Tank meets Kickstarter. An all-new show. Stop it. Okay, think Shark Tank meets Kickstarter. Except it's very different. How different? How about this? Hundreds of thousands of engaged viewers watching live in real time. A new pathway to a new... All right, that's enough, Mr. Epic Voice Guy. This is Pitch, a groundbreaking blockchain-based application that is backed by Ethereum. And it's fully decentralized with smart contracts to provide a new way for prospective startups to gain the capital and exposure needed to achieve their greatest potential. A once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Okay, that one's true. Pitch gives innovative entrepreneurs a chance to quickly launch token sales by utilizing the platform's live pitch video technology to connect entrepreneurs with seasoned business experts and investors from around the world. This revolutionary new app will make you feel empowered, educated, informed, and even entertained. This is the only platform where anyone can watch in real time. Best of all, don't just watch. Be part of the action. An engaged and live audience will also have the ability to actively participate during the entrepreneur's live pitch by asking questions of their own and sharing relevant ideas and opinions. They'll also have the opportunity to instantly and easily purchase tokens from projects that catch their attention and resonate with them the most, changing the way entrepreneurs bootstrap their business, get exposure, and help them get their own innovative ideas off the ground in ways that were never possible before. Pitch, the only place that startups pitch investors live. All right, so that's our video really quickly. Um, so what we're doing is that we're allowing entrepreneurs to quickly start a live pitch with a credit investor right directly through our app. So a lot of you guys have seen Shark Tank, you've seen Kickstarter. Um, so we are similar, but yet we're very different. 
Um, a lot of you guys have seen uh, Shark Tank being one of those shows that people are highly entertained and educated. So an entrepreneur goes in front of this um, uh, credit investor and they're able to pitch them. And in the twist, we're allowing these entrepreneurs and the people actually watching to ask questions um, while the pitch is happening. And the twist is that people can actually buy into the token sales as the pitch is happening right alongside of the investor. Okay, so look, there's a lot of gatekeepers in this space, and there's going to be a lot of cool activity happening on this platform. And we didn't want to be another gatekeeper, so we're building this in a decentralized fashion. We're using Ethereum, and we're giving the power to surface or sync projects to the community. We don't want to be the gatekeepers. We have three main types of user on the platform. The first is the entrepreneur they get the benefit of you know, exposure and also potentially raising capital. And all they have to do is just create a quick summary for investors to look at. Investors can very quickly go live with entrepreneurs and they get the benefit of exposure, they get early access to startups, and they actually earn pitch tokens for their contribution to the community because, like we said earlier, they're actually educating people who watch the show. And then, of course, we've got the audience and the audience, they get, well, entertained, they get um, educated, and they get the opportunity to buy tokens in token sales. So one of the really cool things that we wanted to add into this is actually a reward system. Um, so the way in the fashion that we're gonna do it is we're gonna allow community members people like yourselves to actually help us discern a good project from a bad in a Wikipedia type of style of contribution. And people will actually get rewarded. So imagine a little small child from Africa that is extremely smart. He can actually tell us what's a good project from a bad, making the good projects go up and visible and the bad projects down to the bottom. Then actually, as a matter of fact, now we have a thousand entrepreneurs that want to come on our platform and actually pitch. So we need more accredited investors out there to be able to take on these pitches. So we're actually going to be rewarding these accredited investors through pitch tokens directly through our platform. We also have a three-stage vetting process. A lot of people know that it's a big problem with all these coins that are coming out. Some of them are illegitimate, illegal, and some of them are great projects, but they're not found. So in these different stages that we're doing is the first stage, which is the vetting process, we're calling this uh, information mining. So just any of you guys that are out there that love to watch these things, you wanna check out the white paper, you wanna see who their team is, you can help us and get rewarded with pitch tokens in order to do that. Second stage is that we're gonna be working with third-party third verification. Uh, companies and identity companies and they're going to be able to help tell us whether these people are telling the truth or not about what their projects are about. And then the last stage, which is actually the most fun one, is that we have the actual startups going in front of these accredited investors and they're either going to roast them live or they're going to be really incentivized to say like what these guys are about. So our vision for Pitch Investors Live is to have pitches happening 24-7, 365 from around the world. And we want to help empower um, innovative projects and ventures in a way that has never been done before. So no presentation is complete without a slide on the team. We have <laughs> actually 40 people around the world working on this project, and this just shows a sampling because we didn't want to do two slides, but it's a big team, it's a good team, we have a lot of marketing people, and we have a lot of technology people. And our token sale is live, pitchinvestorslive.com, and please, come to our booth, we're next door, we're kind of in the middle on the other side, um, just come see, see us and say hi. We'd love yep. to speak to you. And we appreciate you guys. So we have like 45 seconds. So if there's any quick questions that you guys want to ask us about the platform, um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, well, one of the, one of the um, you, you're asking about the, what's the incentive for the uh, investors? So it's not a forcing, it's basically we're going to allow them to come on. So some of the advantages of them coming on is that they're going to get exposure. Think about Mr. Wonderful. His name came from Shark Tank. Um, they'll also get early exposure to some of these projects that are really good. And then they're actually getting rewards through our pitch tokens for actually coming on and listening to the pitches. Great, let's give a round of applause. Thank you for a great you. presentation. You can put that down. So now, thank you for sitting through these great presentations. We will 
be announcing them at 1.30. So here's what's happening. We now have a half hour break. If you have a colored tag or a speaker tag, go into the next expo hall at the back of the room. You can get lunch. Everybody else, please go talk to exhibitors. We resume exactly at 1.30. We have a great uh, presentation by Jay Um on investing for startups and investors should you do venture capital, angel, or ICO. So please come back at 1.30. Thank you.